Hey everybody, welcome to Chin Fat. This is going to be kind of a big episode here because what I'm doing is I'm putting together a kind of a, not really such a master class as much as like a, a Premiere Pro Essentials course that's going to go all the way from kind of beginning to end of a production here. So, uh, so you might want to buckle your seatbelts and watch this because it's going to be super exciting. Um, yeah, or maybe not. Anyway, but yeah, in this one I'm going to be showing, from the very get-go, I'm going to be showing how to import footage, how to create timelines, how to edit, uh, and then how to do graphics, some finishing touches, a little bit of sound mixing, and uh, color grading. So this is going to be kind of a, a little bit kind of beginnerish to intermediate, because I'm going to be going over some things that might be a little bit beyond the scope of just somebody that's, that's starting, but hopefully this will give you a good introduction. This will be somewhat comprehensive as far as the steps are concerned in post-production, but I'm not going to get into nitty-gritty details as much as just showing the overall overall process from beginning to end in post-production. All right, so where we're going to begin is we're going to start by opening up Premiere, of course. And I'll try to touch, I'm, I'm on a Macintosh right now, but I'm gonna, I'll try to keep, I, I will try to cover the shortcuts as far as uh, the, the, the different shortcuts from Mac to PC are concerned, because a lot of what we're doing here in Premiere Pro is applicable to a PC as well as on a Macintosh. But I'll try to t talk about the differences between the shortcuts uh, coming up here. First of all, when you open up Premiere, you're going to get this splash screen here. And if you're just working on an individual project, we're going to hit New Project. You can open up previous projects here that recent projects that, have, that you've worked on will show up here and you just click on those and start those. But I'm going to start a new project. And the way Premiere Pro works is it saves the project as a project file. And keep in mind that that project file does not contain media. It just tells the media what to do. So it's going to be a relatively small uh, file that it tells the media how to act. So just keep that in mind that, that this project file will not contain your media. So I'm going to hit browse and tell it where I want to save this. Actually, I'm going to name the project first. I'll call it tutorial project. And now I'm going to go to browse and I'm going to choose a location. I'm going to go to a hard drive here and I'm going to create a new folder. And under this tutorial one folder here, that's where I'm going to be saving media. If I want to organize my media in here, I can, but I'm going to save my project file right into that folder. And it shows the location of where it is saving that project file. So be very uh, conscious of where you are saving your project file so you can find it later, especially if you are switching computers. And right now I'm uh, saving this on an external hard drive, so I could unplug this and go to a different computer and, and open that project up. But just keep in mind that you want to keep all your media uh, located on one hard drive, in one, usually in one location. Especially if you download files off the internet, if you download MP3s or video clips off the internet, oftentimes it will uh, download it into your downloads folder on your computer. But one thing I recommend is to put all your footage into the folder in which you are working. All right, so right here, if I have my my folder that I saved, there, there is that project file that I've saved right there for media that I'm using. I'm going to be using a lot of uh, media that's on my hard drive here, which is fine. Uh, so that would work just fine. But I would recommend if if you download stuff, put it into your production folder before you import it into Premiere. Because then if you get up and move to a different machine, it's going to have your files are going to be offline and it's going to be a mess. So first thing I want to do is I want to do one more little thing to set up and get ready to, to edit here. I'm going to go into Premiere Pro here, my, this little Premiere Pro tab. And this uh, on a PC will be found under File and uh, Preferences. But on a Mac, you'll go under the Premiere Pro tab and go under the Preferences under the, the, the software name here. But once again, on a PC, that'll be under File and, uh, and Preferences. So I'm going to go under Premiere Pro, Preferences, and then we're going to go to Auto Save. Now, Premiere Pro has a different default here for the, the um, for, I can't remember how many minutes. I think it saves every 10 minutes or something like that. And it has a few maximum versions. I like to put it up to like 99, 100, what, uh, so it saves a whole bunch of different versions of my project because they're very, very small files. And then I'm going to tell it to save. I change this to three minutes. I like to, because sometimes 10 minutes of work if I'm really in the mode, in the mode, uh, if I'm really uh, into the edit, uh, is, is a lot of work, and I don't want to lose 10 minutes of work if my machine crashes. So I'm going to change that to 3, uh, and then 99, and I also like a different location for it to save, so I would recommend, highly recommend, uh, saving a backup project to Creative Cloud. Check that, because that. then it does a backup project file, and also, uh, it would be smart to have your media in more than one place. I always tell people that if you don't have three copies of something, it doesn't exist. So whatever media you're using, make sure you got your media uh, backed up on a different hard drive rather than on your computer, a different location rather than on your computer, because if your computer crashed or your hard drive crashed, you want to have a backup of that. So there's two things you need backups of. That's going to be your media and also your project files. So right now I've got my project file there, but this is actually auto-saving to the Creative Cloud folder as well. 
Now that's an, on, that's an online cloud service here. And if you go to your Finder on a Mac or if you go to your Explorer on the PC, which shows all your hard drives and all your network drives, anything else connected, uh, you should find, as long as you're logged into Creative Cloud, you will find a Creative Cloud files uh, as an attached uh, network drive here. And this is, or I should say, a cloud drive. And if you click on that, it'll bring up um, it will bring up backups that you've had underneath different Adobe software that you may be working in. And there's my Premiere Pro right there. If I click on that and you go to the latest version that you're working under and then go to auto save, it will show you, this is just a backup file of another one. This one has not done an auto backup yet because I have not done any changes to the project. Once I import media, it will start auto saving. But this is really, really nice because it auto saves and it will have multiple versions of your auto saves here in, here in the cloud. And that is on a completely different hard drive that's not on your computer. That's something that's on the internet. So that's a, a good place for a backup. If your hard drive crashed and you lost your media and your project file, you could go to the Creative Cloud and grab your project file and then go to your hard drive, to the other hard drive where you backed up your, uh, your media, and you can just drop that project file in there, open it up, and everything should be restored as long as you have uh, the, the, your media mirrored on another hard, hard drive. Now, another thing I like to do before I get started here is when I start importing media and organizing media, I like to have a larger window, a larger window where I can import that media. And this is where you're going to be importing media is down in your project window. You have four kind of major areas within Premiere. You have your project area, you have your timeline, you have your source, uh, your, your source area, and your program area. And you'll notice that these are getting highlighted uh, as I click into these with that little blue line. That means you're operating out of that window specifically. So within the project area, a quick little shortcut to know is holding down your shift key and hit pressing the numbers one, two, three, four. Not on your numpad, but on the very top of your keyboard. So shift one is going to actually select the project window. Shift two will select your source window. Select Shift three will select your timeline window and shift four will select your program window. We will be getting into what these different windows do and how to operate within those different, different windows. But right now we're going to go to shift one and we're going to operate out of our project window, which is where we import and organize media. Here at the top of the software here, you've got these uh, little, these are layouts here. There are different ways, if you're performing different functions like graphics, doing audio mixing, working with effects or color grading, you're going to go up here and click on one of these items up here. Uh, and now if you don't see them all here, I, I kind of like grabbing this little tab here and dragging it to the right and getting as many of these uh, shown as I can. Uh, if you have, if you pull this all the way over and you still have extras, you can click on this little double arrow and it will show the ones that are hidden because, because of a lack of room. Otherwise, if you do have a lack of room, I've got enough room on my monitor here that I can drag this across and I've got everything open now. So just grab that little thin line right there and just drag this back and forth until it shows as many as they can. And if it doesn't show all of them, it will have that little double arrow that pops up here once again to show other layouts. So if I click on one of these layouts here, I like, I like to start off in the assembly mode rather than the editing mode. Assembly mode gives you a little bit more space here for importing and organizing your media. Does it on a tall column rather than the kind of that short little window there and it's easier to import and organize. We still have the same spaces here. We have shift one, which is our project area, shift two, which is our source clip. And these are tabs here. It's sharing tabs within the same window here. Now if I hit shift three, it's going to jump to the timeline. Shift 4 will open up my program window. So these are uh, literally two different windows. Uh, I should say two different tabbed windows within this, two tabs within this window here. So now it is sharing the space between the source monitor and the program monitor. The source monitor is basically a clip viewer, and the program monitor is going to show what is in your timeline. So let's start off by importing media. Shortcut for importing media is going to be Command I on a Mac and Control I on a PC. Almost any time I say Command, the PC equivalent will be Control. There are a few exceptions, but for the most part, whenever you do Command I, Command O, or some sort of shortcut like that uh, on a Mac, the the equivalent on the PC will be Control I, Control O, Control S, whatever shortcut you're using. So to import media, I'm going to hit Control or Command I, and it will import. It'll bring up a window and it will ask you what you want to import. You can navigate through your hard drives and find your footage. And I'm going to grab a range of footage here. Here's a, here's a folder that I want to grab some footage out of. I'm going to grab a range of footage here. I'm going to uh, select the top one, hold down shift, and click on the bottom one. It selects everything in between. I don't want everything in here. i got some project files and other things I do not want. So now I'm going to import that footage. 
Now, after a few seconds, it brought in the footage. You have two different ways of viewing footage. And when I'm in my main project window here, I usually like to have this under list view. Here at the bottom left-hand corner of the screen, you see list view and icon view. Right now, we're in, in icon view. And there's also this uh, freeform view where you can, uh, if we expand our window here a little bit, you can grab your footage and put it anywhere you want to and kind of arrange it the way you like uh, and have it uh, and stay placed without auto-arranging everything. I very rarely use this. I usually like the list view or the icon view. I'm going to go under list view here, though. List view will sort it with all the metadata up here and show a list of your, of, of your clips here. And you have um, and you have options to arrange them by frame rate, by media start. I usually like to have things named by uh, arranged by name. And if you click the arrow changing up and down, it will change it. Now, now it's... it's uh, resorted these based on going from the highest number to the lowest number and also and this is alphanumerical by the way it does things in alphabetical and numerical order now if i want to organize this stuff i'm going to import more footage but i want to put these in organize these into, into a folder let's all import some more footage command i to open up and find some footage to import uh, one thing that you can do is you can either import just the footage like this if i grab this this footage right here and import i'm starting to create a big long list of items here in my project window. Now if I want to start organizing these, I can do this. I can select a certain amount of footage. Let's say I want to grab the, from here to here I'm going to, uh, and I want to put these in, in their own folder. So I'm going to select the top one. I'm going to hold down shift and select the bottom. It selects everything in between. And I'm going to grab this and drag it and drop it into this folder down here. When I drop it on that little folder icon, it's going to put them into a folder or what Premiere Pro calls a bin. A bin is a reference to editing films when they used to have a lot of film that they were cutting on a moviola. They had several bins that they would actually put the dump the film into to organize them into scene folders so they call them instead of folders they call them bins uh, as an, a nod to old fi old film editing and when it drops in that bin it's going to be already highlighted it's waiting for you to ask what you want to name that bin so i'm going to call this farm drone footage and now I can collapse this folder and everything is, uh, if you drop this down, you'll see everything is in that, within that folder there. So if we drop that down again, uh, now it's closed and it's keeping everything neat and clean here. I'm going to grab this footage here and I'm going to drag and drop that into its own folder like this. And we're going to call that one dialogue footage. So let's do one more import here. Command I, Control I. Because another thing you can do, as long as you have just the media in there that you want to import, and you want to import the entire folder, you can go to the folder that you want to import. Say I just want to import all this video right here. You can select just the folder and hit import, and look what this does. It imports the folder, it maintains the name, and it puts everything in there that you have selected in that folder into this uh, new folder right here. And then I can rename that if I just don't want to call it video and call it mirror footage. There we go. So now we have, we can drop these down and look at the footage, the media that I have under each folder. And I would really recommend, especially if your projects are getting kind of big, uh, just don't import your media and then just start editing. Try to do a little bit of organization and a, a little bit of organization will go a long way and make it less confusing. Now, another thing you can do here is you can open up these folders by arrowing down. Uh, and once again, we can show this in icon mode. I usually like to, I like to keep the, my main project tab uh, under list view. And then uh, what you can do is you can double click on each one of these folders here, like on dialog, and it opens it up in a new tab. There's my original project, my original project window right there. And now it's got a bin tab here that I double clicked and it opened, it up, opened up this individual bin tab. So you can jump between these here, click on a different one if you want to go here. Let's do this. I'm going to open up each one of these individual folders here. Go back to my project tab, double click, and now I have these three tabs open and my main project tab. This is kind of the home space here where all this stuff is stored within your project tab and this is your main tab over here. It says project right on it. Yeah, that's how you know that you're working on that. that this is your project tab and then these are your folders that we just opened it up. So now I can toggle between these here and, uh, and look at all my individual media in here. Now are these ones I like for the most part in icon mode. So now I can go down and hit on icon mode or icon view for this window, go to my next tab and go to icon, go to my next tab, and go to icon. And now I have these three tabs open and I can see a thumbnail here and you can change the size of these thumbnails 
by going down and sliding. You can change the way it arranges them as well, because sometimes these will not arrange in alphabetical numerical order. The arrangement that it will be doing in here will be based on, uh, the default is by which one has been used more frequently. I like it to be in alphanumerical order as well. So what you can do here is you go under sort icons down at the bottom for each tab, and I like it under the list view sort. List view sort is going to be under your, this is view sorted right here. So it's going to read whatever you have clicked right here. It's going to read uh, how it's going to arrange these things. I like it to have on name with the arrow pointing up. That way it goes at the beginning of the footage to the end of the footage, the footage that was shot first to the footage that was shot at uh, last in each one of these folders. And I'm gonna click on this folder and we're gonna go down to this little tab here and say list view sort. Now it will organize these uh, by alphanumerical order because my list view sort is on name here. So that's a little confusing, but that, that's the way that works. Uh, same here. Uh, I'm going to pull up this tab and tell this one to do the list view sort. Go to the mirror footage and tell this one to do a list view sort as well. And it will have everything arranged in alphanumerical order because that's the way I have this selection in my, uh, in my list view. Now you can close these tabs here. If you want to get rid of them, you can right click them on them and just say close panel, we'll close them, or you can just hit, uh, with it selected, with that tab selected, you can hit Command W or Control W, which closes windows. So Control W or Command W will close that window, click on this one, close that window, and go back to my project window. And of course, you can have folders within folders. If you go to one of these tabs and you double click, you can do a new folder in, in here. You can right click and do a new one or you can click on the new folder down there and it creates a new folder if you want to organize them into, I don't know, like part one and part two, you can organize them. And then you can just grab the footage that you want to drag into that, drop it into the hover over this folder and let go. And then, or we can just grab this stuff and drag it down here and drop over the folder. And now I have two folders within this one folder. Part one, part two. That's if you need to get into more organization. I'm gonna undo, by the way, you, the way you undo is Command Z or Control Z will undo. Command Z, it undid the name the, the name there that I gave the folder, undo, it brought the footage out of it, undo, brought the footage, got rid of the folder, and I, I keep hitting Command Z until I get back to where I was, and that's where I am right there. I hit Command Z like five or six times there, and now I'm back to where I was. Because it keeps a history of things that you are doing in here, and you can actually see that if you go under your History tab. The history tab is found along in, in your project area here. As you go down through these tabs here, you go way over, and right now it's not showing all of them, so you can click on this little double arrow and it shows the rest of these ones, and it shows all of your tabs right here. And right now, this is not showing my history tab. Under assembly mode, I believe it doesn't have a history tab, so let's go under editing and see if we've got it. Hit the arrow, and there's my history right there. If you wanna add it to your assembly mode uh, history tab, you can do that easily. You can just go up to window and go down to history right here. These are all the tabs that can be shown here. I'm gonna go under history, and it just added the history tab to this to my little project uh, window up here. Now this keeps track, of, every time you open the software, once you close the software completely, uh, it gets rid of your history tab. It just clears your history. So once you open it up, from the time you open up your project and start working, it's going to keep track of all of your moves until you close the software again. And right here, this is the very first thing that I did, is did it open a project here. And then I imported clips, so it's showing all these moves here, and these are the ones that I just did undo, did Command-Z several times on, and you can simply redo all of those just by doing this, clicking on the last one, and now everything is redone. And let's go back to the project window, and you'll see, there I see I have the, I have the folders that I created because I did the I clicked past all that history, all those undos, and it redid all these items right here that I've done. So once again, I can either hit Command Z or Control Z to go back to where I started here under the mirror footage, undo, 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 or I can just go to my history tab and tell it just click from here. That just redid, and this undoes right there. And by the way, the shortcut for just doing one redo is going to be Command Shift Z. So Command Z, as you see, does undo, and it's undoing the moves here, and Command Shift Z or Control Shift Z will redo. And one thing you want to keep in mind is once I've done all those undos here, and it has these grayed out because those have been undone, but once I do a new move, it's going to eliminate the rest of the stuff that's in that's 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 in order here. Once I do a new move, it's going to eliminate all this history uh, that I just uh, did undo for. So if I do something like import some new footage here, let's do Command-I to import, or Control-I. I'm going to import this folder right here. 
Now this is kind of interesting as well because if you import a whole folder that has a whole bunch of metadata information, Premiere Pro will only, it'll give you an error message but it's just telling you that it, it didn't know what to do with those extra files like the AVCD uh, metadata file and these things here shot on a Sony camera. But it will dig through these folders and find the footage that it can use. So I'm going to hit import here. It brings up an error message because there's things in there that I can't import which is fine. I just hit OK. And now I arrow down, and here's it, it dug through these folders and, and kept the folder structure and finally found the media that it can use. Under this clip folder here, it has this clip media and it has thumbnails, uh, JPEGs, which I actually don't want. So I could select this. All I want is this video footage. So I can select this, delete the thumbnails. But that's pretty convenient that Premiere will import, it'll dig through the folders, it'll give you that little error message, but it will find the footage that it can use. But uh, right now, I don't like this organization either. What I'm going to do is I'm going to move this media just into this folder. In fact, let's re rename this folder Outside Lighting, Outdoor Lighting. And now I don't want this folder structure here anymore. So I can select all this media. I can arrow this down here so I see the media. And I'm going to grab all this. I'm gonna, going to grab this. I'm going to drag it and move it up. Notice how it has that little no symbol on that fist. It's like a fist grabbing things there. And then it's got that little no symbol like, meaning it doesn't really know what to do with this uh, unless I hover over another folder here. And I'm now I've got this right on top of that folder there. And I let go. And what that did is just pulled the footage out of that folder and dropped it into my outdoor lighting folder here. I'm going to select this folder that these are now empty, This uh, these series of folders here. I'm going to arrow down. Yeah, this clip folder is in the XD root folder. And if you arrow that up, see, uh, uh, that's where that, that clip folder is. It's all empty. I don't need that anymore. I'm just going to delete the whole structure, folder, the structure of folders here. And now I can close this, and I have my outdoor lighting imported into this folder. All right, let's talk about renaming footage, because as you organize footage, you may want to start renaming the files. What I really recommend is do not rename the original files. That's especially once you've started editing. If you rename the original files, it's going to disconnect everything from the software and it's going to be a big mess. You want to leave the files at their original name in their original folders and then you can rename them inside of Premiere. And Premiere will not rename the original folders. It will just rename that referenced file within Premiere. But I'm going to do, do this. I'm going to double click on this folder. It'll open it up in its own tab. And I've got this already in my, in my icon viewer here. I'm going to make these clips a little bit bigger. And if you want to rename these here, if you're familiar with the footage and you want to rename these, what I can do is select the clip. You can hit enter or return, the big enter or return above your right shift key. And now it highlights it and asks it, what do you want to rename it? Call this Farmhouse 1 and click outside of that. And now it's been renamed. But now watch this. When I right click on this file and we say reveal in Finder or on, on, the, on a PC it would be reveal in Explorer, it opens it up in your computer's Finder or Explorer. And that is the file that is referenced right there. Notice it is renamed in here, but the original file has kept the original name. So if I want to rename these ones, what I like to do is if these are like, I've got like four farmhouse clips here, I can do this. I can hit enter with that highlighted and it highlights the name and I can do command C or control C to copy the name, escape to let go of that. I'm going to arrow over to the right and select this clip and I'll hit return or enter. And now I do command V as in Victor to paste. And now I can arrow back one and rename that to two. And that way I don't have to type in farmhouse all over again. So hit escape arrow to the right, hit enter or return, command or control V as in Victor, arrow back, that one's three, enter, and keep moving on there. Let's move over to this one here, enter, command V, farmhouse four. So these ones are a different sequence where it's following a person here, so I can do the same thing. Follow person one, copy that name, move over to this one, hit enter, follow person two, and you can name these whatever you want. If you have a whole bunch of footage and you've gone through and organized everything and renamed everything, you can go back to your project window and you have a search window up here. If you're looking for some specific footage and you know what you're looking for, I can quickly type in farm and it'll bring up everything that's named farm. The reason why it's bringing up footage here that's not named farm is because uh, this folder is named farm. So it's bringing up everything in that folder. Now another cool thing you can do here, if you want to find those names specifically and not do the folder, you can do what's called a search folder and you can set parameters. This is kind of a cool way of finding or of finding footage that you have renamed here. I'm going to click uh, a new folder here. It's going to bring up create search bin. 
And now down here, I want it to search. And I'm going to do, if you do file name, it'll find the original file name that it's named on the hard drive. But I want to find the name that I've renamed it, which is just called name. So, and it has, uh, you can add two parameters in here if you want to do and, or, you can do an and, or metadata, but I'm not going to put anything in this search engine. I'm just going to do one based off of farmhouse, and it will find all the files that I've renamed farmhouse. Hit OK, and I've got this new folder now that's referencing the original folder here that has just the farmhouse footage that I've renamed. Now, I notice it's missing one of those files in there, my farmhouse too. I think I didn't hit enter on return. I don't think I renamed it properly. So watch what happens with the search folder here. If I go into the, my original folder here and I, oops, right there, see I didn't rename that. So I'm gonna name that farmhouse two for some reason that didn't, the name was undone. So now that I've changed that and I go back to my search fol folder, this is dynamic. Watch what happens. It added it. It took, it took it a second to find it, and then it added it to this folder here. So it adds it dynamically. So if I go and type other uh, clips that are called Farmhouse, it'll keep populating this folder. And now I have that search folder that has those that are searching the files throughout my project here. And if you want to find where that location is that, the, that you have these organized, you can right-click and say Reveal Original. And then it will find the original inside of this drone, drone folder here, the farm drone footage. And that shows where that footage is found. Now, if you're done with that, you can delete these folders. You can keep them if you want to. You can organize them into, I could even do like a new folder. If I've got a whole bunch of search folders, I could do a new folder here and call this search folders and then drag all of my search folders into that specific folder. And then if I do more search folders, I can have this. Uh, so I don't have a whole bunch of search folders here. I can just have them I'll, I'll organize under this search folders uh, uh, bin right here. Then arrow that down and it will have all my search folders in it. All right, so next part here, we're going to start going over uh, media types here because that's going to determine what sort of a timeline you're going to be using and creating uh, to edit in. So the way you view media to see what the attributes are uh, of a specific media, of a specific video clip, a quick way of viewing that is by creating what's called a preview area. And right now, by default, the Premiere Pro does not have a preview area, which is usually up here. What you do is you go up to the project tab here. You hit this little uh, drop down and you go down to preview area. You check mark that and it opens up this space up here, expands the space for a preview area. So now when I arrow down these things here and I select any of my media here, it's gonna show some very specific things. First of all, it has the name of your clip and then it has, for video, it has the resolution, has the pixel aspect ratio, which is not as important these days. Not normally important unless you're working with something like older media or anamorphic uh, footage. Then you have your duration of the clip. You have the frame rate right here, 23.976. It's uh, essentially 24 frames per second. Then you have the audio information, 48,000 hertz, 16-bit audio, stereo channel. So that's going to be very helpful in creating a timeline. And once you create the timeline, you can start editing. But I'm going to look at some other footage here, and I'm going to select this one here. And these ones happen to share the same resolution. They share the same frame rate. Let's go to another one here. And this footage has a smaller resolution. This is 2048 by 1080, but we have a similar frame rate. And pretty much all the footage I have in here is the same frame rate, but, that, but, but uh, with differing resolutions. This one's 1920 by 1080. Uh, this one's 2048 by 1080, and so on. Let's import, uh, I'm going to import a clip that has a different frame rate. All right, so this clip now has essentially 120 frames per second. Uh, if you select that, you can see the resolution, 1920 by 1080, 120 frames per second. This one was uh, shot intentionally to be slow motion. But if you're putting mixed frame rates into a timeline, that's one thing you've got to be aware of. And, and, and you're, you've got to be familiar with what the footage is, why you're using it, uh, what your end resolution is going to be, and your end and, and your final project, what is that going to be? Uh, most of the time film is shot, if you're shooting a movie, it's shot at 24 frames per second or 23.976, but you wanna decide what size of timeline that you're working in here. Let's say we want our final project to be this resolution right here, 2048 by 1080. One thing you've gotta consider is aspect ratio, first of all, because uh, 1920 by 1080 and 2048 by 1080 are two different aspect ratios. But we can mix those in a timeline if we wish, and we'll have to be fixed at a later point. But what I'm gonna to do to create a timeline is I'm gonna grab a clip. Let's say we want our final project to be 2048 by 1080, so it's essentially a 2K file with uh, 23.976. So what we're gonna to do to create a timeline is we're gonna grab this file and we're gonna drag it down, and you can drop it right here in the timeline area if nothing's been added yet and it will create a timeline. It will name the timeline the same as the clip. That is the timeline icon right there. Uh, but I don't want it in this folder, so I'm gonna grab that, I'm gonna drag it out and drop it in this blank area, and now it's out of the folder. Now as I select that timeline, it will show its attributes. It's the same resolution, same frame rate. 
and set up for the same sort of audio type. So what I can do is I can rename this if I want to. I'm going to uh, select the I'm going to select the timeline and hit enter or return and type in the name final edit or something whatever you want to call your timelines. Now if you if you are working in uh, with two if you are working two different timelines in the same project you can grab something like here this dialogue footage that's four, that's 4K and you can and rather than drop it down into a timeline here because this one's already been created you can grab this and drag it down to this little item right here this new item icon and let go and it will create another timeline based on this clip's settings. Now you can see this timeline is the same settings, 24 or 4096 by 2160. We can grab that and drag that out, and then we can select this one and rename it something like 4K Edit. If you're doing different timelines, and now I have two different timelines open. If one of these happen to get closed, you can just simply go up and double click on your timeline, and it re and it reopens it uh, right here in these tabs. So I've got my 4K Edit and my Final Edit. I've got th these two timelines that I just created right here within this timeline window. One thing to realize about these two timelines down here is one is 4K, one is 2K. So one has smaller resolutions or smaller pictures than these ones in the 4K here. Now if we take the 4K timeline and we put footage in it from our, uh, that, that is actually smaller, watch this, I'm gonna grab footage that is a 1920 by 1080. I'm gonna drop it down inside my timeline here and look what it does. It does what it's called window boxing. It scales this down. This is the this is the resolution of the timeline here, but this is the resolution of this file here, a lot smaller. So it shrink it shrinks down and puts it into the smaller one. It puts it in at its actual resolution, and therefore it is smaller. Same with the 2K files here. If we grab a 2K file and drag it down into our timeline, this one will be a little bit wider. It's a little bit wider aspect ratio than the 1920 by 1040, but. Um, so when I go to this one, see so notice that these, the, the sides here are a little bit shorter, and as I arrow to the right to go to the next frame, this is a little bit wider. It's a little bit wider aspect ratio, has a little bit wider pixels than does the 1920 by 1080. It has 2048 instead of 1920. So if you're editing in this 4K timeline and you don't want to have to rescale everything, if you don't want to move over a clip, you can double click on these clips and expand these clips uh, to fill up the screen like that. But that's a pain in the butt if you're editing and you don't want to keep doing that to each individual clip. Uh, what we can do, let me delete those out of there. I can grab the media that I'm planning on put dropping into this timeline. I can select all that media. I can go up to clip and we can go to modify. Oops, let me get all those and select all those clips and go up to clip, go to video options and I can say scale to frame size. What this does is it puts a little check mark on those things and now you can see that check mark is activated right there. You got that activated check mark. And now any of these clips that I, I pull into a timeline that's not the same resolution, it's going to either downscale it or upscale it to meet the uh, to meet the settings of that new timeline. So I'm gonna grab the, this 2K file and drop it in the 4K timeline. And now look what it does. It zooms it to fill the uh, 4096. That's not necessarily increasing the quality of the file. It's still a 2K file, but it's being it's being rescaled to, me, to fit within that 4K timeline. So same thing, if we go to my final edit here, then this, one, this is a 2K timeline. So this one's 2K, this one's 4K. In fact, I can even name this one 2K so we can keep them straight. 2K edit, and now we grab some 4K footage and we drop it into this timeline. Look what happens. Let's move over it. This is what happens. Notice how it's crap. It's cutting off faces. It's basically it. This is basically 2,048 pixels across of a 4K file. So this is uh, basically too large, and it's zoomed out. So once again, you can do that. You can do the same thing I showed you before. You can do the same thing I showed you before, where we can select this footage, go up to clip. Go to video options and check mark scale to frame size. Now when I drop these uh, clips in, we get the full frame. It zooms it down to fit into the frame. But if you have a different aspect ratio, then you're going to get something like this. This is 1920 by 1080, which is not the same aspect ratio. When I drop that into my 4K timeline, and of course this is zoomed down. I have not done the modify clips yet, so I'm going to do that right now. I'm going to select all these clips. So I'm going to select all these clips. I'm going to go up to clip. Go to video options and scale the frame size. Now this should zoom this up, but look at this since it's not a matching aspect ratio. It zooms it up to fit the screen, but it, once it zooms it up, notice the sides have these what are called pillar boxes on the sides uh, because the aspect ratio does not match. So to fix that, you'd either have to double click on this and then zoom it up till it meets the edges like so. And then it crops a little bit off of the top of the bottom because that's not the same aspect ratio. All right, for now, I'm just going to get rid of the 4K at, uh, timeline here. But now we got a timeline, and I'm going to select my footage in here, and I'm going to delete it. And now we can begin. And now we are pretty much set up here to start editing. By the way, every now and then, I recommend hitting Command-S or Control-S for save. And what you'll see, 
There's that little flash right there where that pops up and it updates your project file. Any changes that I've made now are saved to this project. If this machine crashed, that would be the latest save right there aside from the auto saves. So now we will start getting into editing. So I'm going to go up to the arrangements here. I'm going to arrange by editing here. I've got everything organized, so I've got in a nice organized fashion here. I'm going to go to my project window. In fact, I'm just going to close this mirror footage window right here, and I'm going to go to the folder that I want to start editing from. Let's say I want to edit some of this dialogue here. I'm going to double click on this. It'll open it up in its own tab. I'm going to arrange by icon view and bring up these icons. Okay, if I've got enough footage in here that I, I have to keep scrolling, uh, scrolling up and down, let's show you a little shortcut. Let's show you a little shortcut that will allow you to see all the footage in here. If you move your mouse over any one of these windows here and you hit the tilde key, it's the key above the tab key to the left of your number one on the top, uh, on the top of your keyboard, underneath the escape key. If you move over this window and hit tilde, look what happens. It opens that window full screen. So now you can really take a look at the footage. You can see footage. If I have a, like a folder with a lot more media in it, like right here, let's double click on this one. It opens it up. We're going to go to icon view and we've got this little scroll bar to kind of move through the footage here. And if we don't want to do that, I like doing this personally. I like just moving my mouse over this window, hitting tilde. It goes full screen. Now to get out of that, you hit tilde again. And it will do it over any window that you hover over and hit tilde. And then you hit tilde again to get out of it. So I'm going to open up this one here. I'm going to make my I, I'm going to make my thumbnails uh, larger by sliding this little slider at the bottom here, right there, so you can kind of see a better uh, thumbnail image. And I'm going to go over to this little thing as before and say I want to list view view sort, which will be in alphanumerical order. Let's see which one my project window is in. It's arranged by name, alphanumerical order. So now this is arranged in alph alphanumerical order because it's the same as my list view. So now you can preview these files by hovering your mouse over a clip and I'm not clicking here I'm just hovering and moving my mouse left and right and you can kind of see what's on a clip by doing that you can get a quick little preview by doing that by moving your mouse over left and right we'll go in reverse and forward on these thumbnails here if you find a file that you do want to use and you want to edit uh, let's go to this one right here you can simply double click on it or you can have it or you can select it and hit shift o Shift O will open the clip, or you can it does the same thing as a double clicking on it. So let's move over. Let me do it to another clip, like right here, this clip. So I select that one, and I do Shift O, and it opens it up in my source monitor. The source monitor is a clip viewer. And what we've got here is we've got the timing of the entire clip right here. And this is your playhead. Your playhead will grab this clip. Over here, this is the duration. That's This whole clip is 2 minutes, 1 seconds, 1 second, and 21 frames. Over here, it shows you where you are on that timeline. I am 5... Five minutes, 38 seconds, and, and seven frames on the time code. This is an arbitrary time code. It doesn't start at zero. It has a rolling time code in this camera. This was shot on the red camera. So it is uh, has this uh, rolling time, time code, this record run time code going here. Whenever they hit record, the time code starts running. And then when you go to the ne next clip, it takes off from where it left off. So the clip starts at 4 minutes, 58 seconds, and 12 frames. And then it ends 7 minutes, 0 seconds, and 9 frames. And by grabbing this playhead, you can basically skim through the clip all you want and view the clip in that fashion. And then if you want to see another clip, tilt it over this window here, select another clip, double click on it, or shift O, and then skim through it. Now if you want to play, you just press your space bar, and it will play the clip. And a little trick here to navigate through this, uh, through this clip are the letters JKL on your keyboard. I'm going to put my fingers on JKL, have them all on this keyboard at the same time, and watch what happens if I hit J. J will rewind, K will stop, and L will go forwards. So you can see my playhead advancing there going forward, K to stop, J to rewind. Now if you hit J more than once, I hit J, J, it goes one and a half times speed. If I hit J again, it goes two times speed, and again we'll go two and a half, and three times, and so on, until it maxes out. And L the same, you hit L, it goes forward, forward, and faster, and faster, and faster, until it kind of maxes out at the top speed there. So that's kind of a quick way of navigating through it, or you can just simply grab your playhead and skim through it like this if you're looking for some visual. I personally like the JKL when I'm speeding through a clip and I get ready to stop on the fly by hitting K at the point that, around the area that I want. Now to go through this frame by frame, you use your left arrow and right arrow. Left arrow will go backwards one frame at a time. You can see my frame counter there going back one frame at a time. And as I go forward one frame at a time, my uh, right arrow, it skips one frame at a time going forward. If you hold down shift, right arrow and left arrow, it jumps through five frames at a time, forward or backwards. 
So just some quick navigation features there. If you need to go to the beginning of the clip, hit your home key and it jumps to the beginning. If you need to go to the end, hit end underneath, underneath home and it goes to the end. Now we've already created a timeline. I dropped the clips in there and I deleted them. I just, I dropped the clips down there just to create the timeline and then I deleted them. But now we're gonna start editing. So I'm gonna grab the first clip that I wanna drop into the timeline. And I'm gonna go this, this is the first uh, shot here. The shot is uh, number one shot and it has four takes. One, two, three, four is the take number there. So I'm gonna go take four because take four was the good take. The last take isn't always necessarily the best take, but usually is. So I'm gonna go to this clip and I'm gonna double click on it. It opens it up in my source monitor. I wanna find a moment to start this. So I'm gonna start playing through. I hit home to go to the beginning, press play, and I wanna start my shot right where the dolly starts moving. So right there, the dolly starts moving. I'm gonna pause it there. I hit K to stop, or, or you can hit spacebar to play and pause. And this is, I wanna take a portion of this clip and put it down on my timeline. So I'm going to hit the letter I on my keyboard. And what that does is it sets an endpoint. It still has the handles, the excess footage on here, but now that's where the clip is going to start, is right there right after the dolly started moving. So I'm gonna press play again here, either L to forward or spacebar and get to this where I want that next edit. We're gonna to cut to a, a close up or a medium shot of the character here. So she, here's a knock and she looks up and I'm gonna stop right there and I'm using my arrows back and forth to get it to the exact frame where I want to. Arrow right there where her eyes look up. And let's say what, that's where I wanna cut is right there. So I'm gonna put O for out point. I and O, they're right next to each other conveniently on the keyboard for in point and out point. Now to drop that into the timeline, I simply have to push period. Period and comma are overwrite and insert. We'll show you insert a little later, but period is going to drop that in point and out point into my timeline, period. So now I've got that clip down on my timeline. Shift three to jump to my timeline, home to jump to the beginning of my timeline. And now I can press play. I have the same navigation features, J, K, L, or spacebar to play through this. And I have just that edited clip in my timeline. And then she looks up right there. So I'm gonna go to, and find the next clip that I want to, like a medium shot or a close up. So right here, 1B1 looks like I've got a nice kind of um, a nice close up there. So I'm going to double click on that. And I want to find that same moment where she looks up. There's the knock, she looks up and I'm going to match it, get it to the point where her eyes are looking up there. Hit I for endpoint, press play to play through it. And then she looks back down into her book and maybe I want to cut back to the wide shot there. So I pause it, O for out point and I've saved that little portion there, and now I'm gonna hit period to drop it into my timeline. And now I have two edits down here. Shift three to jump to my timeline, home to go to the beginning, spacebar to play. And you'll see as it's playing through this clip here, it'll cut to the next clip right here. It looks up. There we go, it needs a little bit of matching, but, that, but I'm getting the basic shots down into the timeline that I want. Let me get one more clip, one more edit down in here. So here we ended when she looked back down at her book. So I'm going to get that to the same point here. I'm gonna J to rewind. There she's looking up. I'm going to hit shift and arrow right so it goes through five frames of time. Right there, she's looking down and I can uh, fine tune it, go, go my left arrow or my right arrow one frame at a time to get it exactly where I want to, right on the frame, right there. I for end point, press play. And then she gets up and goes over to the window to see what's going on. We'll stop there, go O for out point, period to drop it in, in, and now I have three clips down on my timeline. Okay, some ways of viewing things in your timeline here. First of all, these uh, edits here are really, really small and kind of hard to see a little bit. So one thing I can do is you can zoom up on these edits here and you can zoom out. You have this little bar here at the bottom that will zoom into the edits and make your clips longer so they make them more manageable. Or you can grab this and drag it the other way and shrink them. There's some shortcuts to do that as well. You can hit just the plus and minus on the top of your keyboard will zoom in and minus will zoom out. So I'll make, it, make them bigger or make them smaller, make them more viewable. By the way, the slash above the return or enter key, uh, backward slash, that is what gives you, uh, what, that is what zooms this, your whole timeline within your viewable space. So I'm gonna hit, so I'm gonna hit that slash and it zooms it within the, my viewable space here. And if you're zoomed up too close like this and you hit that slash, it brings everything back in to so where you can see the entire timeline. Now I want my track height higher as well. You have the quick feature of doing shift plus. Shift plus will take it to a standard track height which will also give you thumbnails at the beginning of your, of your edits here. Or you can just move over to the side and you can simply grab this little uh, line right there and drag this and make each individual 
uh, track higher if you want to or lower or you can actually move your mouse over right here in the middle hold down option or alt and scroll up with your mouse or scroll down will change the track height of that individual track all right that's the track height I, uh, that's the track height that I like right there or I'm just gonna hit shift plus and take it back to that standard track height that's what I like right there uh, for my standard track height if you hit shift minus it'll go really small like this if you're trying to see other tracks the shift plus will take it large now I'm gonna check out my edit here I'm gonna hit home press play then it will play through. Hear the knock. She looks up. Looks back down. Knock happens again, and she gets up. So here I have, I'm editing my movie. All right, so let's say you actually might want to insert a shot in between one of your edits here. We're showing you how to do what's called overwrite. And overwrite is where you are you keep adding things to the timeline. Let me show you the difference here. Let's open up this clip here, this mirror effect clip here. Let's open up another bit of footage here so you can kind of tell the difference between the footage here. I'm going to open up my um, drone footage here. Double click on it. Range this by, it's already on list view, sort that's good. But say we want to all the, say we suddenly want to insert just a little bit of a, a footage from this and put it like right in the right in between these two clips here, which doesn't really make sense within this movie. But just let's let's just say we want. All right, so I'm going to go and find a portion of the footage I want here. I'm going to put I for endpoint. Play through that. Let's put maybe about like five seconds in here. O for out point. And now I'm going to insert it uh, between these two shots. So what I want to do is jump to the timeline, uh, shift three to jump to the timeline. But now I want to land on this edit right here. I, you don't want to really eyeball it because sometimes you might get it off by a couple frames and you'll get little flash frames in between. So what I recommend doing is using your arrows up and down. Up will jump to edits to the left, down arrow will jump to edits to the right. So right here I'm hitting up arrow and then down arrow. But I'm gonna, so I'm gonna land on this edit right here and insert between that shot. So arrow down. Now if I hit period, period is an overwrite. Watch this, if I do period, it overwrites. And, and uh, this is just a video, no audio. So it actually just ate into the clip right there and that is an overwrite. It overwrote into the clip there and ate into the footage there. So the, in this instance, that's not what I want. So I do command Z or control Z to undo and I do comma instead of period. So the period will overwrite, undo, and the comma will insert. It will shove that footage uh, in between those uh, that, that edit and push everything else on the timeline down. And now I have that shot inserted. So now we cut from here to our drone shot and then back to our close-up there, which doesn't really make sense, but who cares? We're just showing you how to do this. But uh, you can also use overwrite. Overwrite's very, very applicable with uh, things like documentary or interviews when you're putting B-roll on top of interviews. Uh, so you can actually assign this footage to go somewhere else if you want to. Uh, down here, what we've got is a, a couple different things here. The, we've got the uh, toggle tr track targeting. This is for copying and pasting while you're on a timeline here. In fact, let's demonstrate that really quick. And then this is, this is called source patching. Let's show the difference between these two. So I'm going to go to the end of my timeline here. I'm going to hit end and jump to the timeline. I'm going to put uh, period to drop my footage here at the end. I'm going to hit slash to show my the backslash above the enter key to show the entire timeline. Now I want to grab this and I want to move it. Uh, let's say to right here. So I'm going to um, I'm going to select that. And the way to shortcut select that you can just click on it with your mouse. But if you want to keep on the key, if you want to stay on your keyboard, uh, I'm going to arrow up. So it's at the beginning of the clip, and that clip is now on the play. Uh, the playhead is now touching that clip, and you can hit D to select. Uh, the playhead will select everything that it's that it's hovering over there. Now I'm going to use uh, a, a popular word processor shortcut here, which would be Command or Control X, C, and V, which is cut, copy, and paste. So now I'm going to do Command X or Control X, so it cuts that clip there, and now it's holding it on a, on a clipboard ready to paste it somewhere. Now I can arrow up, and I can paste it here by doing Command V. Now notice that does an, that does an overwrite. The Command V just simply does an overwrite. I'm going to undo that or Control V. And now I'm going to do Command Shift V or Control Shift V, and it will paste. It'll do what's called a ripple paste. It pushes everything else. If you just do the simple Control or Command V, as in Victor, it just it does an overwrite. If you do a Command or Control Shift V, it will paste it. Uh, it will ripple paste it and shove everything else on the timeline down. So that's kind of a way of, of, of moving things around on your timeline. 
Now, uh, if we say we want to paste it on this uh, top track up here so it's not eating into this video. And the reason for doing that is if you were doing like an interview, let me grab a bit of, um, of dialogue here. We'll pretend that it's an interview. So I'm going to show you the difference between track targeting and source patching. Track targeting deals with basically copying and pasting things on your actual timeline here. Uh, so like I just showed you with the command X, C, and V, uh, if we grab this here and we do command X or control X to cut it, and now it's floating on that uh, cl clipboard ready to be pasted. And rather than paste it over this or do, do an overwrite here, I wanted to do an overwrite on the track above it. There's some more practical reasons for this. I'm going to show you uh, one instance in, in, a, in a minute here uh, dealing with like Dr documentary or television or what we'll, we'll show you when you're shooting an interview. Uh, but right now I'm going to highlight the uh, v V2 track up here. Now if you paste with this one turned on, it's going to default to the bottom most one and on audio it'll default to the top most one. So what you have to do is you have to turn this one off and t turn on V2 and now when you paste, it will paste onto the track above it. That way it doesn't overwrite this video footage here, but when you play through it, it will cut to the track that's on top and then cut back to this footage below. So as we play through, it cuts to that footage on top, and then when it hits the end of this, it cuts back to the video below it. And that way it doesn't eat into the video. And this works really well with uh, using documentary uh, footage, or in this instance, this is a, co a commercial here that was shot. And I want to put some B-roll here, so these guys are advertising their store. And don't forget to bring in your gently used equipment to make a few bucks for the next season. The Gear Room, your gateway to the Wasatch. Our store carries a wide variety. And I'm going to do a little bit of rearranging here. I'm going to select this clip right here, do Command X, because it would make more sense if it was like right here in the middle. Command Shift V, and we inserted that in the middle there. All right, so now I'm going to use uh, track targeting here to put some B roll on top. So we've got this little edit right here. A few bucks for the next season. Our store carries a wide variety of new and. All right, and then it cuts to the wide shot. But let's say we want to cut to some footage right here, some B roll. I'm going to go to my B roll tab here, and I'm going to find some footage. But rather than use track targeting, I'm going to be using uh, the source patching. Now, the source patching is not for copying and pasting on your timeline. That's what the targeting's for. Uh, but the source patching deals with um, with taking footage from the source monitor and telling it where to go in the timeline when you're editing it. And that's when you're using rather than than uh, cut, copy, and paste. We are using uh, period and comma, overwrite and inserting. So right now, these two items are highlighted over here. That This is reading the clip that I have loaded in my source monitor. And it's saying that clip has a video track and it has an audio track associated with it. If I go back to the drone footage, the drone footage only has uh, video footage and no audio attached to it. So I'm going to double click on this and when that loads in the monitor, notice how the audio disappears. Now it's, it's reading the footage that's in this source monitor and it's saying this has a video track and it's saying where do you want to put it? Well, if I don't want to put it there and I want to put it up here, uh, then I can put it on top of the footage. And this is best for editing B-roll to what's called A-roll. The A-roll is this stuff here where they're talking and the B-roll is what goes on top that, that we cut to. So I'm going to arrow up and land right here. And now if I, and I've got an in point and out point already, if I put period, it'll overwrite and it will put it on top. This footage doesn't really make sense, so I'm going to get the footage that does make sense. Now as I play through it... Our store carries a wide variety of new and used outdoor sporting equipment. And then it cuts back to them. So I'm going to delete that, and I'm going to go back to... But I, I did want to show you that just because I wanted to show footage that didn't have any audio. Because this footage has audio that was shot with a camera, but I don't need it. So I'm going to get that little rack focus right there. Hit I for in point. And O for out point. And now I have an, uh, I've got a video track and an audio track. If I wanted to keep the audio, I could put it down. I could move the audio down here. And now when I paste that, let's arrow up... Uh, now when I overwrite, it'll put the video and audio here and here, and it won't overwrite. It won't kill any of this footage or audio here. But now if I don't want that audio, right now I just want the, the footage and not, not audio. So what I can do is just go down and turn the audio off. It still says A1 because it's still reading that this has, has uh, audio to it, but now it is not. it will not paste the audio down here, though. So now when I hit, hit period, it drops my footage down there, and we play through it. Next season. Our store carries a wide variety of new... Cuts to the clip. Let's say I want to shorten that. I'm going to trim that a little bit. We will get into trimming here in a little bit. And let's grab some more footage. Tilt over this. I'm going to make my thumbnail size bigger. Find a shot that I want to insert. Right here, let's use this tilt up. Okay, I want to use that shot. O for out point. And I don't want the audio, so right now that is disabled. And period to drop that in. For the next season. 
Our store carries a wide variety of new and used outdoor sporting equipment to get you climbing, skiing, and anything in. And there we go. So I didn't overwrite with three different shots, and I had my track targeting on this V1 here. So if you did want to cut back to the footage, we could cut back to the footage. I mean, if I remove that, it'll cut back to the footage. I mean, to make a few bucks for the next season. Our store carries a wide variety of new and used outdoor sporting equipment to get you climbing, skiing, and anything in between. See, and I like it with the footage in it. But anyway, that is the difference between source patching and track targeting. Okay, so I've come back to this project here, and what I'm going to show you next is I've done a few more edits to the project, but I'm going to show you guys how to do uh, some fine-tuning in the timeline. Now that we've shown you kind of that little assembly way of getting clips down into the timeline, I'm going to show you how to fine-tune these things. If you need to shorten it, edit it, if you need to put some st uh, stuff in between, if you need to trim it, if you need to lengthen it, uh, I'm going to show you some of those uh, those items here. Now your toolbar on the side here has some options to help do that. You have a blade to cut, you've got some uh, selecting tracks forward which we uh, we showed you. We've got the ripple tool, the roll tool. Uh, if you open this up right here, uh, click on this little toolbar right here, it expands it and shows it. It's got this little teeny arrow down in the corner that means it expands to a, a larger menu that has more items in it. So this has, these These are very commonly used tools here, ripper, ripple and roll. I don't ever use these over here because I just use shortcuts which is a lot easier. Uh, first of all, let's show how to do some little trimming in here. Let's show how to do some cutting in here and then, we'll, and then we'll do the trimming. So first of all we're going to show, and right now if you have one of these uh, items selected over here and you want to need to get back to the arrow, because your arrow also acts as a selection tool, uh, you can go over and click on the arrow or you can just hit the letter V. V is in Victor. Uh, it even shows the shortcut if you hover over it here. Uh, v will get you back to the arrow tool. So V brings back the arrow tool and now I can select items again. I can grab items and move them around uh, on the timeline. So as we play through this here, I kind of intentionally made some little uh, continuity mistakes in this in my timeline here so I, so I would have to fine tune them. But as we play through this here, we have it where she looks up and then she looks up again. So she looks up twice. Here she looks up and then it cuts to her looking up. So if we want to if we want to cut the excess off there, so, so if we want to match cut this, so right where she starts looking up, so it matches with this shot right here, where her head finishes looking up, I've got to find the spot where I want that to cut. Okay, right here she starts to lift up her head. Let's say I want to cut right there, and I want to cut all this excess off right here. I'm going to show you several ways of doing this, and then get into the easiest ways. So right now I can hit the letter C, which will select my blade. That's the shortcut to select the blade. Now I can move it over, and you want to make sure that your snap is turned on here. Because your snap, if it's blue like this, if it's white, it won't snap to your playhead. If you turn that on there, and it will it will snap. Look at this. As I get close, it suddenly magnetizes and sticks to my playhead, and it's going to cut it exactly on that frame right there. So now I just I click, and it will cut it. And now I have uh, this extra little slice of video there. I'm going to hit V for my arrow. I'm going to select that, and I'm going to hit Delete. And then I'm going to select the space and hit delete to delete the gap. That's a lot of steps, but I'm going to show you how to do that. But that's essentially what we're doing. So now we can play through this. Let's see if that looks better. That looks better. Now we have kind of a match cut when she looks up uh, right in the middle of where she's looking up. So I'm going to undo that. Command Z, Control Z a bunch of times until I get that undone. And I'll show you a, a bit easier way of doing that. You can either use a ripple edit or there's another cutting tool we're going to show you. So we'll get to ripple editing later on. Let, let's right now stick with the cutting. So if I want to cut that, I'm going to get this in the same spot where I wanted to have the cut right there. She starts looking up. And now I want to cut the rest of that off and fill the gap there. So what does that all in one move would be the letter W. W, what that does is it cuts everything to the right on the rest of this clip here. And then it, and then it uh, fills the gap. So if I hit W... It just did all those things that I just did, all those steps. It cut it, it selected the gap, and deleted it for me, and then pulled everything down the timeline. And Q also works on this as well. Let's say we've got some mismatch continuity. Here, I'm going to mismatch this. I'm going to do a ripple edit. I'll talk about what a ripple edit is, but now I have it a mismatch on the other clip here. As I play through this, she looks up. Starts looking up, and then she's looking down and looks up again. Now now we have it on, on this end point rather than, than on this clip's out point. So what I can do now is I'm going to do the same process as where I want to get to the ending frame here, we're going to see what she's doing. She's barely starting to look up. And then let's get to that point here where she barely starts to look up, like right there. And now I want to eliminate this stuff to the left rather than to the right. Q will eliminate things to the left. And these uh, keys are ge geographically located right next to each other. Q is on the left. W is on the right. So if I hit Q, it eliminates to the left. And if I hit W, see if I move in here and want to get rid of the rest of this, W will eliminate to the right. So that's a quick little shortcut to, to trim things down on the timeline. 
I mean, if you want to expand things, sometimes you can just grab a whole bunch of clips like this, move them out and grab this clip and expand it out. You can just go right to the edge with your arrow tool and that is a trim tool. And you can trim Eclipse in point or out point by just dragging it like this. Now that we've shown how to cut, let's talk about uh, trimming here. And cutting is a, technically a type of trimming, but now, now we're going to talk about trimming in this sense where you can grab the edges and you trim. I already showed that you can grab the edge and extend or shrink your out point, so your in points. You can select the middle here, uh, the empty space, and hit delete to fill the gap. But if you're going to be using ripple and roll here, ripple and roll or some very uh, handy tools. And you don't need to go over here and actually select it, because I, I like to just use uh, a shortcut. You hit Command or Control on a PC, uh, and that turns this trim tool into a ripple or a roll tool. And I'm going to explain what that does here. So I'm going to move my mouse over here, and that's a trim tool. If it's red, it's a trim tool. Now I'm going to hold down Command, and it is changing it temporarily to a ripple tool. If I get it, and, and this, and it's doing it to the clip to the left here. If I move it over, it turns it to the uh, a yellow arrow to the clip to the right, and now this is a ripple tool. And if you move it in the middle, right on over the edit here, this is considered a roll tool. And I'm holding down command, or it would be control on a PC, the whole time uh, to change the arrow, temporarily change the arrow to a roll tool, or ripple, or ripple. Now what a ripple tool does is basically this. If you want to shrink or extend a uh, an out point or in point, and then have it fill the gap, and this is going to, so a ripple tool is only going to affect the one that you're hovering over and it will not affect the adjacent clip. So if I want to shrink this here, I'm going to hold down command and turn this into a ripple tool and I'm going to grab this and drag it to the left and notice up in my program monitor what's happening. It's showing the new out point and it notice the in point to the left to the right is staying the same. It's not it's not adjusting at all. It's only adjusting the out point of this clip and you can actually uh, extend this out point further to the right if you want to and then when you let go it shoves everything else out and it's added that, uh, that much length onto the out point there. Undo that and if I want to grab it and do the same thing and drag it, hold down command or control, grab this and drag it to the left. And if I even find like an exact frame that I want to end on, I can get my playhead and move it right where I want to cut. Say I want to cut right there. I'm going to hold down Command, and I'm going to drag this to the left. And then when I let go, it pulls everything else down and trims that out point. And that is considered a ripple tool. What the ripple tool is really good for is, you, uh, is good for matching action. It's good for continuity. So here we see we play through this. And we have her look up and then look up again. We have her look up twice. And right here, she's kind of, and at the end of this, I'm going to get right to the end of this out point here. And she starts looking up and her eyeballs are, she blinks and her eyeballs are looking up there. So if I wanted to match that, I can grab the, uh, I can do the ripple edit to the right here on this clip's end point. Hold down command, turns yellow, grab this and drag it. And now I can drag this until she blinks and then her eyes are open right there and I got an exact match. I let go and those points are now matched as I play through this. Those points are now matched. She blinks first. It's really subtle, but she, she blinks first and then looks up. And her eyes open as she looks up. And see right there, maybe I want that her eyes are, are barely shut here. Maybe I want to match that even a little bit more. And by the way, uh, to make windows go full screen, I think I already mentioned you move the mouse. I did already mention that. You move the mouse over the window and hit tilde. Hit the tilde key, which is above the tab key. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work on that match right there. I'm going to grab this uh, endpoint here and I'm going to drag it around and actually I'm going to turn off the snap so it stops snapping to things right now because I'm going to fine tune this. So I turn off my snap and I'm going to move over to my ripple tool and drag it to the right and let's get that right where her eyes barely right there are opening up right about there and see how that looks. Just add a couple frames. Kind of nitpicky but that's what editing is. And that looked good. Yeah, the blink was like right right on uh, when she started blinking here and her eyes opening up. That was like a perfect match. So now let's go over roll tool. Once you get it matched, you can use your roll tool uh, to change where the edit happens. And what the roll tool does is it change, It basically does this. Uh, when you change the timing on this, you, you drag this over like you're doing with the ripple uh, tool. And then there's this gap here. Rather than bring everything over and fill up the gap, you're going to grab this endpoint and drag that over too and compensate by extending this clip's endpoint. So I'm going to undo that. So that's what a ripple tool does. It changes the endpoint and the outpoint, uh, the adjacent clip's uh, endpoint and outpoint simultaneously. So if I hold my uh, command down, turn this into the ripple tool right here in the middle. It's red, the, the arrow's going in both directions. Now I can grab this and drag it. And look at that. See, look, look she lifts her head up at the exact same time. But now I can decide, maybe I want to go a little bit before she looks up. Uh, while the deli, just right where the deli ends here, and drop it off there. So now let's play through it. 
She's looking at the book. She's still looking at the book. And then she looks up. So that, that I kind of like that a little bit more. Or, or we could go the other direction as well. Have her look up and then we cut to the close up. So let's drag it this direction. And now here she fully looks up. And then we cut to this uh, cut to the close up. And either way it works. And, but I kind of like that before. I, I, I like the previous one when I, when I rolled it backwards. But that's the difference between ripple and roll. All right, guys, so for um, after showing how to do kind of the basics of editing, I've got a different project here. We're going to uh, advance this project, and I could have done it with the earlier one, but this one has, um, and take that one all the way through the full process, but this one has some dialogue in it, so I'm going to be using this to kind of show uh, sound mixing a little bit. Um, so yeah, so kind of the basics of sound mixing here. Once you've finished a project, or when, once you finish editing and you're ready to start sound mixing, and you're ready to start sound mixing, uh, th the first best thing to do is to go up to the top here and range for audio. Audio will bring this little panel open here on the side and we'll have some quick features to help you fix your audio here. One thing I can kind of hear when I'm playing this back, you can hear some ambient noise and that might not be so bad, but say you want to get rid of that. So what I'm going to do, first of all, the, the first step of, of uh, mixing audio is, is typically mixing the dialogue or mixing any like narration or any sort of vocals uh, to the levels that they should be at. And we're working in a stereo environment, which, you're, uh, which means your dialogue will be normalized around what we call negative 12. This uh, stereo environment has what they call a, uh, a 12 decibel dynamic range, which means normal audio hits around negative 12, and then from there it gets louder, and it would be around negative six will be loud, and above that will be very loud, and you never wanna hit zero. Zero is where your audio clips into storage. And audio below negative 12 will be uh, will be quieter audio relative to the to your normal audio. If something's supposed to sound quieter, it will be down here, maybe around, I don't know, negative 30 or negative 42, uh, depending on how um, how quiet that sound should how quiet that sound should be relative to your normalized audio. Like I said, a stereo environment, we're going to be working with audio that's normal at negative 12, around negative 12. Uh, so first of all, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to select all my dialogue here. Because I want all my dialogue to be normalized, and I'm going to go up, and we're going to assign this as dialogue. When you assign this, it adds a tag to these things, uh, to these uh, to these files here that I've selected, uh, and then it will add these filters that it needs to fix these things. And I'm going to go to, uh, first of all, let's go to loudness. Loudness is going to be where we normal normalize this, and since this is dialogue, dialogue is usually normalize around negative 12. So it will detect what it thinks is uh, what it thinks is dialogue and it's going to try to get it right around negative 12. So let's hit auto match. And this sometimes will take a few seconds. We'll be finished here very soon. Uh, I'm very sorry for your loss. Valerie had been sick for a long time. I'm, I'm just glad she's finally at rest. I guess that's the way to look at things. Still, it must have been hard to wake up and... Yeah. Okay, so now what it's done here is it's normalized what it t t detects as a dialogue here, and it has brought the dialogue up to negative 12, but it boosts the whole clip up as well. So now the ambient noise is louder, which we're going to work on cleaning up, but then when the, this guy speaks here... We'll be finished here very soon. Uh, I'm very sorry for your loss. So now when this guy speaks here, his audio, and the ambient noise, notice the ambient noise is louder. It boosts the whole thing, to, this whole clip, to get it up to, it gains it to the uh, level, uh, to where this level is at negative 12. If we undo that, here was it, here's what it was at before. We'll be finished here very soon. Around negative 24, so let me redo that. And now it is around negative 12. We'll be finished here very soon. Uh... I'm very sorry for your loss. But what you'll want to do is kind of play through and make sure that everything worked. I noticed that there's kind of an issue over here and maybe at the end as well. Let's play through. Valerie had been sick. See, and his audio's too loud there, just a little bit too loud. But then in the second clip. I'm just glad she's finally at Sounds good. Sounds like it's at the right level. So we're going to move forward. And I'm going to go through each one of these here. I guess that's the way to look at things. Still, it must have been hard. And here his audio is normal right here when he says still. Look at things. Look at the level. Still. Very, it's too loud. It goes up above negative six, which is really loud. So we're going to fix some of this stuff. Now this one here especially, because he was kind of whispering when he says yeah. 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 So it brought that way up, and it's, and it's way too hot. So I'm going to select that one there, and I'm going to say clear audio type. It's going to clear the audio type on just that file there. And now it's back down to normal. So we'll work on that one manually here. Again. We're just about done here. Let us know if there's anything we can do for you. And then the end here has the same issue. It boosted everything way too hot. 
Thank you, Detective. Not sure why, because that's pretty clean audio. In fact, we could even go clear and try that one individually and see what we get. So I sign it as dialogue, auto match, and it does the same thing. So we're just gonna uh, we're just gonna clear that audio type as well. All right, but let's go to the beginning. The, at the beginning, this audio all, all that worked out nicely. But I'm gonna go to the next one here because this first one is too loud. Dollar has been sick when he first speaks. It's too loud. Now we need to bring that one down, but the second one is good. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the key framing option right here to bring it down and then kind of uh, turn it back up. Uh, I'm going to turn this audio down, have it come back up to its normal level here. So let's let's do that. First of all, you have to be on a, a expanded track height and you have to have your uh, your audio keyframes on. So I'm going to click click on this wrench here, make sure that my audio keyframes are showing. That's fine, and then. I'm going to hit, if, if my tracks are really small like this, it gets rid of the, the keyframe line. So I'm going to hit shift plus to bring it up to a standard track height. Now I'm going to hold down, and by the way, I'm on a PC now because on my Mac, I cannot record the desktop audio unless you do a bunch of finagling with like the Soundflower software and I can never get it to work. So, uh, so that's just horrible. Anyway, so I came over to the PC for the sound mixing part and we'll go back to the Mac for the other one. All right, so now I'm going to do, the way we're going to add the keyframes, you're going to hold down control or command where you want these keyframes to get hit. I'm going to hit one here, and I'm going to hit one right over here, right before this one starts and right after this one ends. Now I'm going to grab this uh, line in between, and we're going to turn this down by about, let's do, let's try like three decibels, right around three decibels. Uh, negative three decibels, because it was up around negative six, and actually that might need to be more around six decibels, but, but let's listen to it. Valerie had been sick for a long time. And that's not too bad, maybe one more decibel would be fine, right around four. 4.6, let's try that. Valerie had been sick for a long time. I'm, I'm just glad she's finally at rest. So here it's turned down, and here it turns up. And it keyframes from here, it starts gradually turning up to that point right there. So I'm going to do the same on this little point here where he says still, because everything else sounded good. I guess that's the way to look at things. That sounds good. That could even be a little louder. But let's go, let's add a keyframe here. I'm going to add a keyframe here for the word still, one when it finishes, and then one here for a pivot point. So now we can grab this, and we can turn this down by like, I don't know, six decibels, five decibels. Let's try that and see what it, and I'm gonna turn this one up a little bit by about a decibel, decibel and a half. Let's try that. I guess that's the way to look at things. Maybe even a little bit louder. Still need to get up around negative 12. I guess that's the way to look at things. That's better. Still, it must have been hard to wake up and there you go. Now, if we're going to gain this audio over here ourselves, so this is basically what that dialogue thing is doing automatically. I'm just going to, but it did it way too hot on this line right here. So I'm just going to hit G for gain with this clip selected. And I'm going to increase this by, I'm guessing about, let's try 10 decibels first of all. I'm going to type in 10, hit enter on my numpad. I'm typing this all into my numpad. 10 and enter. And it turned it up. Yeah. 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 A little bit more. It's supposed to be quiet, so it doesn't have to be up to negative 12, but maybe up to like maybe a little bit of above negative 18. Let's go gain another maybe four decibels. Yeah. Yeah. And that's this one's around negative 12, which is fine. So actually, I'm going to undo that. Control Z or Command Z, and I'm going to leave this one the same. I'm going to turn this one up. So I'm going to have kind of these pivot points here. There. Crank this one up. Maybe I'll turn it down just to kind of make it easy easy matching to where this last one took off, right? Where, where this last clip took off here. So you don't notice the shift in the audio level. Yeah. Yeah. Now we could hear we could hear the ambient noise go, turn up there, but we're gonna do some stuff to clean this up here. Go to the next one. And I'm, and I'm gonna continue doing this till the end. On the end, very end file here, I'm probably gonna have to crank that one up manually as well. Thank you, detective. Yeah, that needs to go up by about six decibels. G for gain. Six, enter. You can even do negative if you want need to turn it down instead. You can do G and then go negative however many decibels, 10 decibels, and then hit OK. But I'm not going to do it right now because I want to boost this one up. And it shows that I have already gained that clip by five decibels right there. Thank you, detective. There we go. Okay, so once, and this is another one that needs to turn it down right here, right before. Four, and then it's going to turn back up after that first line there. So let's try that. Just crank this one down a little bit. Here. Let us know if there's any. See, and that's still pretty loud. Let's turn that down a little bit more. Let us know if there's anything we can do for you. And then turn it gradually up as he speaks here. 
Let us know if there's anything we can do for you. There we go, and those levels sound good. Okay, once we've done that, we're gonna try cleaning this stuff up. So I'm going to select uh, my first audio here that already has the dialogue assigned, and I'm gonna go down to, I'm gonna uh, close loudness, and I'm gonna go down to repair. And under repair, I'm gonna say, we're going to reduce the noise. It's gonna detect that kind of low uh, bassy noise there, and it's gonna to try to remove it. So I'm gonna hit, remove. there's a lot of automation going on here. You can do this manually as well, but this a lot of this automated stuff works really well within Premiere. And I'm gonna turn it down, uh, instead of 50%, what's considered 50%, I'm gonna turn it down to maybe 30% effectiveness. If it gets too high, it'll, you'll start hearing uh, the, the processing that's taking place. All right, so now if we play this back, here's with the reduced noise. There's without. You can see here a, a, a total difference there. We'll be finished here very soon. Uh, I'm very sorry for your loss. All right, now if we want to move that reduce uh, noise filter over to other clips, what I can do is I can select this clip, we can go up to effect controls and it will show the effects that it's added to it here. It's had a volume increase effect and then it did a denoise here. I'm just gonna copy this one. I'm gonna hit control C and copy because I just wanna put it on all of these. And I'm gonna select these and I'm gonna do control V and paste and it just pasted that effect to all of these clips because I didn't wanna mess with the volume on some of these. Some of them I did volume, some of them I didn't. And then like a couple of these I did not do volume adjustments on. Uh, or I did not do automated volume adjustments on, so they, so I just wanted to copy over that denoise filter to each one of these clips. Valerie had been sick for a long time. I'm, I'm just glad she's... Still. And that sounded pretty good. That sounded pretty clean. We're, but we're going to be adding back some sound effects to this too, by the way. And let's go, I'm curious about this next one right here, how that turned out. Yeah. Yeah. And that one probably needs a little bit more reduced noise on it. So I'm gonna go up here to the noise and I'm gonna double, I'm gonna edit, hit edit, and I'm gonna turn this one up to maybe like 40% and then see what that sounds like. It's the same as doing it on the slider over here, but let's, let's listen to that now. Yeah. Yeah. And you can still hear it a little bit, but when we put ambient noise on this, this is going to hide it a little better though. So when I start adding sound effects back to this. All right, onto the next stage here, I'm gonna import and I'm gonna import my sound folder here. I've got some uh, downloaded files from uh, some sound effects from freesound.org, and I've got a music file from incompetech.com. I'm gonna import that folder. That's all free stuff that you can use. And we're gonna arrow this down, and first of all, I'm going to add uh, some ambient noise to this. And I've got some rune tone right here I downloaded from freesound. Double click on that and play through this. I see a little click right there. Let's get it right in the middle. It's very subtle, but but we can increase that. I'm gonna I'm gonna hit endpoint for right there because I don't want this little noise back there. Uh, so I'm gonna start an endpoint here. I'm gonna go down to my timeline. I'm going to source patch. This here is reading whatever file is inside your uh, your source monitor. So I'm gonna change that to change this to track two. And now it's gonna whenever I edit this down to the timeline, it's gonna edit this down to down to track two. So in my timeline, I'm gonna also put an endpoint I for endpoint. Go to the end and arrow back one frame, so I'm on the finishing frame here of my movie. And uh, by using arrows, I hit, uh, I, by the way, I hit end to go to the end of the, on the keyboard to go to the end of the timeline, and arrow to the left to go back one frame, and over out point. This is called the three point edit. One, two, three. It's gonna take this end point, line it up with this end point down here, and play it until it hits this, and then cut it off. So I'm gonna hit period to drop that in, and it drops on that lower timeline there. And now we're gonna listen to this with uh, the, the audio listen to this relative to the, uh, the dialogue level that's being played here. And we can hit mute here while we're playing and listen to with and without. Mute, without mute. And very subtle difference, but I wanna increase that a little bit. So I'm gonna select it, hit G for gain, and gain it by, I don't know, maybe six decibels. Let's give that a try. Enter. Now we're gonna listen to it again. All right, I like that uh, the ambient noise level. And once again, you can hit mute and mute, mute it and turn the mute on and off while you're playing. And you can hear the difference with and without the room tone. You can actually, if you'd like, if you want to have a natural uh, sound reverb, it'll be very subtle, but you can go up and assign this as uh, ambience here, and we can add a reverb, and we're going to make this um, room ambience here. And it automates a little bit of reverb, a little bit of echo for the ambient noise, and just makes it sound a little bit more natural. Very subtle. Now listen to this. So to me, that, and I don't know if this translates over YouTube, but that sounds a little bit more like three-dimensional to me. It's not surround sound, but still it feels a little bit more three-dimensional to it. So it's a very subtle uh, addition there. Okay, uh, a couple other things we can add. If we're going to add like sound effects of maybe the gurney wheels here, this thing walking by, I've got the gurney wheel sounds here.
as these guys are walking, we can put that in and see how this thing sounds. Put an endpoint, change my source patch down to the next track. Let's make a little bit more room here. Uh, down to the third track here. Uh, I'm just going to try to drop that on my timeline right now because this is really short. So let's let's see. I don't need a three point on here, but let's see if that kind of works. This is very loud. We'll be finished here very soon. So what we're going to do is we're going to hit G for gain. And we're going to bring that down by, and once again, all this is relative to our normal sounding audio, which is our dialogue. So I'm going to negative, take that down about uh, six decibels, play through that and see how it that sounds We'll a be finished better. here very soon. Uh, and now, like, if we want a door open, if these guys are going towards the front door and you want to hear a door open in the background and, and shut, we can grab the door sound effect. And here's the shut. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to grab this door open right here. I want to create a whole sound effect where the, the door opens, you hear it, you hear it uh, creak open, or you hear it like creak open or creak, creak shut. So I'm going to grab this first part here. So I'm going to put O for out point, I'm going to drop that onto the timeline, and let's see how that works. Ten. Uh... I'm very sorry for your loss. And then we might even, and then we can probably put a little squeak in here. And here's a creak at the very beginning. So I'm going to put in point and just get a little portion of this. Maybe, maybe right, maybe right here in point. and out point like they're taking it outside and I'm going to hit period to drop it onto the timeline and we're going to level all these things and make them found, sound uh, just right here and then let's get the door slam, the door shut here at the end. Right here is the door shut, I for end point. I'm going to drop that into my timeline, out point, drop that in and now let's see how that sounds. Right now it will be very distracting because it's going to be too loud so we're just going to make these kind of subtle. Uh, I'm very sorry for your loss. That sounded fine, the level there. Valerie had been sick for a long time. I'm just that sounds very distracting, so I'm going to select this, and then we're going to go G and turn down by about maybe eight, six decibels. Valerie had been sick for a long time. I'm, I'm just glad she's fine. And then we're going to make that door slam a little bit more subtle as well. We'll put it after he gets through speaking. I'm going to move it right over after he gets through speaking here. And then we're going to go G for gain, negative eight perhaps. Rest. I guess... And then it sounds like they're working in the background. So we're going to go maybe negative four, a little bit more. I guess that's the way to look at things. Still, it must have been hard. There we go. And then you can include other things in here, especially like when he walks away from, from, uh, from him. You could, add you, louder foot, you could add louder footsteps as he's walking away. Because right now we're hardly hearing any footsteps, so we could add some footsteps in there or something else. But let's put, for the end here, let's put in some music. So I've got some sad music here. This guy's wife just died, so we're gonna get some sad music. And I'm gonna add a track. I'm gonna right click down in this area here. I'm gonna, uh, in my timeline, I'm gonna zoom out here so I can see a blank spot. I'm gonna right click in this. And I'm going to move over this track here and right click and I'm gonna say add track here. And it's going to add another track uh, below here. I'm gonna hit shift plus to bring that track up to standard track height. Move my video up here a little bit so we have room enough to see our, our sound. And we're going to add this music here on the timeline. I'm just going to drag the I'm just going to drag the whole thing down. I'm going to drag this little audio waveform and drop it down onto this timeline right there. Or you could add the source patching, activate the track there, and let's listen to this music as it starts with the scene. We'll be finished here. Okay, so uh, let's see. That music doesn't seem to. Let's let's see if there's a different portion of the music that sounds better to match the scene. So this I got got off of Incompetech.com. Incompetech is a website that gives you free royal, it gives you royalty free audio. You just have to credit uh, the artist in the in your in your credits. And I like that music a lot more right there, the second portion of the song. So I'm going to put an endpoint right there at the beginning. Let's get it right before that music starts. Right there. Do I for endpoint. That's where it starts, and I'm going to go on my timeline, and we're going to go in point, go to the end, hit the end key, arrow back one frame, O for out point, and period to drop the music in. And now we'll get keyframe the, and now we will keyframe the music and get it to the level where we need it. So I'm going to play this. We'll be finished here very. And that's good. I like that music, but then when he speaks, 
But when that, but when this guy speaks, and what I'm going to do here is because I'm going to be showing you guys how to add credits to this later on. Uh, so what I what probably want to do is, and I'm going to move over. I'm going to move over my uh, timeline. Hit tilde. I'm going to grab this here and have the music start a little bit beforehand where the credits are going to be, which we're going to add later on. So there'll be imagine a credit here right now, but then um, but then when the music swells up, it, it kicks in on the movie here. So let's play. Nothing yet. So, oh, actually, I need to move all this stuff down. So nothing moves out of sync. I have to move all that stuff down except for the audio, except for the music. So move that down to right there. And by the way, I'm going to add a, uh, let's do a fade in on the audio and a, and a dissolve in. And a, a fade in on the audio and a fade in on the video as well. So while I'm right here um, with my playhead right at the beginning of the video, if your shortcut is Control D or Command D to add a fade in. That adds a fade in now on the video. And now let's add a fade in on this audio right here. So I'm going to do Command Shift or Control Shift D. So once again, it's Control D or Command D for the for the video fade in. Control Shift D, and your playhead has to be right on the lined up right on it. Uh, Control Shift D or Command Shift D to add a fade in on all the audio that it's touching right there. We'll be finished here very soon. All right, let's all right. Let's say we want the music to play throughout, but right now it's too loud. So I like the beginning, the level at the beginning here. And when it swells, it gets up to around 18. But when he speaks, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a keyframe here and a keyframe right when he speaks, a little bit past. And I'm going to drag this one down so it gradually turns down right before he speaks. This is called ducking your audio. So let's play through this. We'll be finished here very soon. And Premiere does have, uh, if you go under and assign it as music, it does have a ducking audio feature that ducks it under the audio. It works better with narration over like a, a, with a music on a documentary or something like that, like that. In fact, let me undo this and show you really quick. I, I don't like it for dialogue because it, it keeps turning it up every time they stop talking, which gets really annoying. And it works well for documentary, but not for a dialogue. So if I got this selected, you can assign it as music. And then you go down to that ducking uh, audio feature right here, check mark it. And you can make it more sensitive. You can make the duck, you can, uh, make the duck amount here, how much it, du um, it ducks the audio compared uh, to the level of the, the video here, or the, the level of the dialogue. But let's hit generate keyframes and see what it does. There we go. And actually, oh, it ducked it down uh, right before he speaks automatically and then keeps it down. Uh, and then brings it back up in the middle. See, in this little yeah, yeah part is so quiet that I brought it up over that. So like I said, I think it works better with uh, with narration. So I'm going to undo that and just do my keyframes uh, that I was going to plan on doing myself. But it is a cool feature, like I said, if you're doing documentary with uh, with uh, narration and, and music underneath. So I'm going to put a keyframe here, turn it down a little bit, and let's listen to how that sounds. We'll be See, and I want that a little more gradual, so I'm going to grab that. Drag it to the left, hold down shift so it locks it down to that, locks it to that level and doesn't let you change it. We'll be finished here very soon. See, so, and I could even bring this down just gradually, just a little bit more over time. Uh, I'm very sorry for your loss. Ballard had been sick for a long time. See, so, and relative to that, that dialogue, I think I want it down even a little bit more. I'm just glad she's finally at rest. There we go. Nice little music the under, look at things. underneath his speech. Still. And then at the end here, maybe after he walks away, we can bring, bring, turn the music back up again. So right if he says, thank you, detective, we're going to add two more keyframes and bring that up more gradually. Thank you, detective. There we go. And let's get that maybe right there where the audio turns down. And we can go to the end. I'm going to hit uh, arrow down, arrow down to land on the ending frame there. Control Shift D to do a fade out. And let's, let's see how that sounds. Beautiful. All right. So there's a quick little overview on audio mixing. So as we're getting into post-production, next we're going to be going over color correction. And we're going to get into titling as well. And then we'll kind of sum up with titling. Uh, and show you guys how to do some quick, easy titles. So once you're done with sound mixing, another thing you can do is move on to the step of adding effects and also doing color grading, which we're going to cover now. All right, so, uh, so with a clip like this, let's go over the effects first of all. So I've got this little dolly shot here. Let's arrange this for editing layout here. Uh, yeah, you want to be in the editing layout for doing effect work or under, under the effects layout. 
I kind of I think the editing is a little bit more simplified and easier than the effects layout, so I'm just going to stick with that. Uh, but right now we've got this clip here. I'm going to play through it, and this is a, a dolly shot. And the camera shifts a little bit, like right there, and it's it's not such a smooth pan. So what I'm going to do is uh, there's a ton of effects you can work with within Premiere, but you go down here, and if you don't see it here, you're going to go over to this little double arrow there, click on there, and click on Effects. The Effects tab will open up, and you can go under Video Effects here. You have Video Effects and Video Transitions, but I'm going to go under Video Effects. And there's one under here in, in particular that I'm going to use is the Warp Stabilizer. But you have tons of them in here. If you want to like blur something uh, or do it over time, you can keyframe it. Like if I grab this Gaussian Blur, you can drag it and drop it right under the clip. And then with the clip selected, you want to go up to Effect Controls, and it will show the effect controls right here. Uh, the Gaussian Blur, we can grab the blur and turn up the blurriness, and it does it real time based on your graphics card. And you can actually keyframe that as well over time over here on the side. If you want to have it be out of focus and then come in focus, uh, we can turn on the keyframer right here for blurriness. Click that and it adds my first keyframe. And right there on that keyframe, it's out of focus. And then we'll move into maybe right here and add another keyframe. This is your add keyframe here. This is to jump between keyframes. These little arrows here jump and land on keyframes. Now that I've landed on that keyframe, I'm going to say at that point, I want zero blurriness. So we'll go from 125 blurriness, uh, level blurriness down to uh, zero. So we play through that. Now it looks like it was out of focus and it comes in focus. So you can do that with any effect that you can find down here. You just have to kind of go through these folders and search them out. Uh, another f effect that I like that I'm going to grab here, I'm going to kill my uh, the Gaussian blur there, just delete that. And you can search these. You can go down inside the video, you can go, do, go down this little search window and I'm going to type in warp for the warp stabilizer. There's my warp stabilizer. Going to grab it and drop it onto this clip. And it'll immediately start analyzing. It's going to try to stabilize the shot. Uh, most shots you don't want it on this. Uh, by default it's on subspace warp. Uh, this doesn't have any warping so I'm going to turn off the warp. It's just finished stabilizing there. Uh, but now I'm going to turn on this, and I'm just going to tell this just by position. Sometimes if your camera's rotate, rotating or moving scale, if it's moving in and out or even zooming in and out, you'll want to put on scale as, as well as rotation and position. But right here, I just have to put on position. It'll stabilize it, zoom it up a little bit, and now that shot is stabilized. This wasn't a very shaky shot before, but now this is really smooth. You don't see that camera pan in there anymore. It's really, really smooth. So it's kind of a quick overview of adding effects there. And like I said, you can just go down here and like, I just go, sometimes we'll go down through the video folder and just start looking through them and see what they do. Some of them you might have to do a Google search on and see what they do. I mean, there's so many of these that I haven't even used all of them. So, and there's some cheesy ones and some good ones. So you just have to kind of uh, find the ones you like and, and use those. All right, so for color grading, we're gonna go under color. I'm going to switch back to my dialogue here. This scene is already, these, these, clip, these clips already have kind of a, a look that have been added to them that were done in, in camera with a LUT in camera. I'm going to mute the audio there, so we're just working on the visuals here. Uh, but now uh, I've, I've arranged to go under the color arrangement up here, and it brings up this panel on the side. You can also use scopes if you know what the scopes are. I do have a full-on tutorial on color grading on my channel as well, so if you want to check that out. Uh, but the scope's going to help you with things like brightness, color balance, and saturation. And I usually use these three, uh, the Vectorscope YUV, uh, the RGB Parade, and the Waveform. And I put the Waveform under uh, Luma mode, so it's just measuring brightness levels. And then this one is for my color balance here. Some of the basic controls that you're going to be wanting to use under color, when you're in the color grading mode, your playhead will automatically select the clip that it's over, and it will add the effect to that specific clip. Now, things that you may want to fix uh, down here, uh, you'll have all these tabs here, basic correction, uh, creative curves, color wheels and match. I'm not going to get in, in, into detail on these things because I do have a specific uh, tutorial that is just for color grading that I get into depth on all these uh, all the, the, the scopes but uh, just basic correction here well, a couple cool things is if you have uh, first of all when you click on basic correction here pull that tab down uh, you have a tone you have tone sliders down here which are dealing bright with, with specifically brightness levels you have a saturation uh, slider right there and then you have a temperature and tint temperature and tint deals with two different two different complementary colors which is blue and orange and green and magenta <clears throat> and these will offset the color of the color balance of your image to get it to look accurate one way you can do this kind of quickly is grab this white balance selector right here move this little eyedropper over something on your screen over here that is supposed to be white that has detail in it and you click on that 
and it will adjust the colors based on what it thinks. Uh, that that it's defining this as white. So the white material bounces light, the true colors of light, uh, while black is more absorb absorptive. So they use we use white to basically tell tell what color of uh, light is bouncing off that. And by that, it's shifted over towards the orange and a little bit toward the magenta. And uh, based on my color balance here, th this has three different waveforms here. Uh, basically, your red channel, green channel, and blue channel, and the brightness levels of each one. And if these things look about the same levels, then your color is going to be balanced. So let's let's turn this off and show you before. See, in here it shows a little bit more of a green shift. So it pulls the green down a little bit, and the image kind of looks a little bit bluish as well. So it's it, it balances this shot here. Uh, and if I check mark, bring turn this back on, uh, you can see yeah it has pushed them a little more towards the warmth and towards the magenta, just very subtle. So see, it just warms it up just a little bit. And, and subtracts the green just a little bit. So down here, so those are your colors, and you can mess with these on your own if you want to get it more, shift it more towards uh, the cool co colors or the uh, or the warm colors, and then you have the temperature and tint, which shifts more toward the green or the magenta. Down here, you have your tone sliders. So this is going to be brightness levels. Uh, this you're going to watch the waveform here. Uh, you got zero to 100. Uh, zero is where detail are, are is basically your dark levels. 50 is the mid gray, and 100 is your white, your highlights. And this is a, a representation of your image from left to right. As we move over partway, about uh, halfway over, we can see that we got a, a peak of white hitting around 100. That's that uh, window back there. Uh, but most everything is in a pretty good exposure range here. Uh, we do have some darks that are pushing down to zero. So you could decide that if you want to get the darks and bring those, just bring a little definition back. You could push the darks up a little bit from zero, the blacks. Uh, this controls the whites, which is the tippy top, the highlights. Uh, the shadows are just right above the blacks here, just a little bit, like probably around 20 to 40 IRE. What's considered, I, what's called 20 to 40 IRE. These numbers that they call IRE, which is Institute of Radio Engineer. It's a standard that's been set up by that institution. Highlights uh, are going to be just right below the whites, just a little bit below the whites, like kind of 60 to 80 region and then exposure is going to be your general just over exposure of your image so if you need to expose it a little bit more you can bring up your exposure i uh, slide these around till you get it where you want to if you have a very flat image that looks kind of flattish like that you can grab your contrast and drag it over and it's gonna it's going to push a larger spread between the highlights and the darks and you're really going to get some more uh, contrasty definition right here is very exaggerated this image already has some contrast but most images if you need to add contrast to it you can just grab your contrast slider slide it over and you can see what it's doing there how it makes it flatter and makes it more contrasty. It's so, uh, defining the darks and the highlights further away from each other. And saturation is going to be your color. Uh, so how much uh, color that you have in the image? As you drag this all the way down, that's zapped it from uh, all the way from saturation. And as you boost it up, that's going to be oversaturated right there. So you kind of get those levels where they look good and natural, or if you're intentionally going for a stylistic look and going for a little bit more of a saturated look, or if you're going black and white for film noir, then you can pull your saturation all the way down. There's a whole bunch of other kind of uh, complex, a uh, little bit more advanced features down here. Uh, but like I said, if you want to learn those, watch my tutorial on color grading with a Lumetri panel. In fact, you can just search it in YouTube and you can type in uh, chin fat Lumetri color grading and it'll bring it up. This is the one from one year ago. This is this is one from about one year ago from the time that I'm recording this. So that would be the one. And it's like an hour and 16 minutes. So it's, it's very in depth. So when you're color grading, uh, but last, last step here with, with color grading, when you're color grading, you're trying to match your shot from, uh, you're trying to match all your shots as you're going through a scene. So what I'm going to do here is we can go under, we can click on this right here, which is the comparison view. If you don't ha have that, you can click this little plus button, grab the comparison view, which is this icon, and just drag and drop it down inside and let go, and it will be there now. So the comparison view, if you click on that, it's going to show a side-by-side -side view. This is the one that I'm color grading, and then this is what you want to compare it to. This is your timeline. And right now it's at the beginning of the timeline, which is just uh, blank, has nothing there. So you can grab this and scroll through and find what you're trying to compare it to. If we're trying to compare these two shots, actually I'm going to move to this one here. This one that I've already color graded that first shot. So now I'm going to go back to my first shot and compare it to this. So you can do this side-by-side -side so you can compare them. And see in this one, once again, I can tell it it needs to be warmed up a little bit. I can grab the eyedropper, click on the white there. That's not really white. That's kind of cream colored, so that's not going to work for my white balance. So I'm guessing that I'm going to have to warm this up a little bit, get this on a little bit on the warmer side. And now the colors are starting to look a little closer there, a little less magenta. And there we go. We're get, getting that closer there. Uh, if we increase the saturation, if we did more of a saturated look, we can saturate it. I don't think I did here, but let's go back. Yeah, let me let me boost the saturation on this one a little bit to match those. And then we go to the next one. We want to match the saturation and the contrast too. We kind of have a heavy contrast, so I'm going to 
uh, beef up the contrast there. And you can use these frames to, to compare. When we go to the next one, now I can move this, advance this. I can jump to edits by clicking on this right here, and now I can compare these two here. See how the face is really dark? I can kind of bring down bring up the, the darks a little bit, bring up the shadows as well to bring up that detail, and then do, do the rest of the color uh, matching that I had from the previous frames, that I had from the previous uh, two clips before that. But yeah, you try to kind of match it going shot to shot. So I like that little comparison viewer to do that. And then when you're done, just turn that off. Last thing with color grading here is, as, you, as we play through this, we're basically jumping over the shoulder to that over the shoulder, and then back to this one. So this one I've already color graded, so I don't need to repeat that. So what I can do is I can go back to this clip right here, go up to the effect controls, and there is my Lumetri color uh, effect right there that's been added automatically when I started color grading it. I'm just going to select that, do a Command C or a Control C on a PC, and then I'm going to move uh, to this clip right here, and then I'm just going to do Command uh, V as in Victor, it's like X, C, and V, cut, copy, paste, and I'm going to do Command or Control V and paste, and I just pasted that effect to this clip and the color grading's done. Same here, I get to this clip right there. I don't want to have to do that one a second time, so I can go here. Or actually, let's let's go down and let's let's paste it on all those over-the-shoulder shots. There's another one, Command V, done. Then there's one more, Command V, and done. So I've uh, color graded all those over the shoulder to this guy. Let's do the other one. So I'm gonna now, now that I'm hovering over this one here, I can go up to the effect controls, copy that, move forward. There's this one I need to, and then I'm gonna paste it on his under there. Move down to the next one, paste, there we go. And then the last shot is this wide shot again, so I can go to the wide shot at the beginning, copy this one, go to my end shot, paste that, and I'm done. And my whole thing's all matching and color graded, and I'm good to go. Okay, so once you have finished uh, doing your sound mixing, your color grading, and you're almost uh, set here, and say we want to do some titles on our movie. I know this is a really, this is just one scene, but let's pretend like this is my entire short, short film. And I'm going to turn this off mute because if you export with this mute on, it's not going to export the audio. Uh, so now I'm going to go to the beginning here. Let's go under uh, graphics up here, captions and graphics. I'm going to select that, and it, it, and it adds a new panel over here, which is the essential graphics. So to, to add a new graphic, it's pretty to add a new graphics. It, it's pretty easy. You go up to the toolbar here and you select uh, the T here. Uh, the T is the type tool. And if you move your mouse over, if you move your mouse over a clip here, like right there, it'll add it on the layer up above. So I'm going to bring this down a little bit just so I can see a little bit more space here. So I'm going to put it over my video here, and I'm going to click right here in the middle. I want it like right about here. Put a uh, click right there, and it brings a little bit cursor right there, and I can just immediately start typing. What it's done is it's added a graphic layer on top of my video here, so it, it puts it on the very top so it doesn't eat over your video. And now I can type in my movie, whatever title you want it to have. So I'll type it in, and immediately after I type it in, the best thing to do is go up and click the arrow, and it puts this wireframe around it, and then you have access to all the editing items over here. Uh, first of all, if you want it centered within uh, within the box that you have here, in fact, let's put this... Uh, let's let's add a let's call this my awesome movie is the title of my movie my awesome uh, movie and let's say I want movie on the next line so I'm gonna go over here hit enter uh, return and put it down uh, one line here but let's say I want it centered within this box here I'm gonna hit the arrow to so now I can edit it and I'm gonna move down and then this is the center right here center it's this centers within the box not on screen but within the box. So now it is centered in the box, but I can center it on screen by hitting this little item right here, horizontal center and vertical center if I want it up here. Uh, right now it's uh, kind of bleeding into the white there. Uh, but let's, let's do some, let me move it over just so we can do some editing here. And uh, I'm not going to have it go this long into my movie, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grab this, the wireframe here. You can increase the size by moving these nodes here. You can go down and change your font. Oh, see, nice uh, marshmallowy uh, font there. I'm just going to go with that because it's it's awesome. It doesn't fit my movie at all, but who cares? I can choose whatever font I want. But uh, if you want it to stand out a little bit more, you can do what's called a stroke, which is uh, a border. Uh, but the, right now it's a white a white border. I'm going to click on the color here. You can click the fill color and change this. Let's change it to like red. Hit OK. And you can see the stroke now, that uh, white outline. You can make that dark. You can click on it make it make it black. Hit OK. And now it's got that black outline. Then you can increase the stroke size, which is the, the border here, uh, right there. Or you can do it as a drop shadow. There's all these uh, all these items down here. You can check mark and do a drop shadow and change the color, change the opacity, a whole bunch of features you can change. So I'm going to grab this. I'm going to move it down like this. I want it um, horizontally uh, centered. 
So there it, uh, there it is, perfectly centered in, the, in my image. Now I can move down here, and I can I want this uh, to I want this to start off with the music. I want my title, so I'm going to just trim this over like that. I'm going to select it, the whole thing. I'm going to hit Command D or Control D, or add a cross dissolve on both sides. So now it will fade in and fade out. So at the beginning, fades in. It's superimposed over my video. And I want this to fade out before they cut from the wide shot there. So now it will fade out. We'll be finished here very soon. And then it cuts to the over the shoulder. Okay, let's say I like that style right there. Let's say I like that style right there. I'm going to grab this and I am going to hold down Option uh, or Alt on a PC. And I'm going to click and drag while I'm holding down Option or Alt. And drag this to the right and it duplicates it and it creates a copy of it. So I'm going to grab this and drag it uh, to the end here. I would I want to fade out at the end, so I'm going to arrow up right there. Do Command D to do a fade. Do a Command D to fade out. There we go. There's my fade out right there. My audio fades out, so I'm going to grab my title and put my title right here because I'm going to use this for my end credits. You can do scrolling credits as well with a short film. I, I'm just going to show you. You'd have to just Google scrolling credits. I'm just going over the basics here. But let's say I want to do a quick credit list uh, for my short film. And I'm going to, so I've got this copy. I've got the exact same font and style as before. I'm going to uh, double click in here and I'm going to say directed by Chin Fat. I directed my movie. Directed by Chin Fat. All right, so now I've got this title here, but let's say I want to put more titles. I'm going to go up and, and click the arrow so I can arrange it. I'm going to uh, drag this up. I'm, as I'm dragging, I'm going to hold shift and it will keep it locked to the middle. And now what I can do, with this graphic file here, this one file here, you can have as many graphics, uh, graphic layers as you want in this. So I'm going to go up here, and uh, that, is my, that is my only text I have in there right now. I'm going to right click and I'm going to duplicate it. I made a copy of it, now I have two of those layers and they are uh, uh, superimposed on top of each other. So I can grab this and drag down and hold down shift. Uh, as I start dragging, hold down shift and it locks it to the center position. And then I'm going to say, put, put the cast name or something like that, Brian. And then we'll put his name. I can't remember. John Denver is that who the who plays Brian. I can go up here and right click and duplicate. Choose my arrow tool and grab this and drag it down and hold shift while I'm dragging. And then we'll say detective. And these guys, I guess, I guess they're brothers. We'll say Ted Denver. So they're brothers. So I can put uh, three. I can put three or four things uh, titles on the screen if I want to at a time. Uh, in fact, let's grab all these. I'm gonna hold down Shift and select all these, and then I'm gonna arrow. Then I'm gonna drag it down and kind of center them like that. So now when the movie's done, my title fades in, and let's say that's as long as I want it. So I'm gonna trim this over, and let's put put a, uh, a, a credit for the crew. So I'm going to hold down Option or Alt and grab this and drag it while I'm holding down Alt and Alt or Option. And now that's a duplicate here, so now I can have this be the crew one. Let's say DP um, Mary Johnson Grip Harry Cruz. There we go. Okay, so that not um, sound Frida Gazpacho. There we go. Is that how you That's not how you spell gazpacho, but I don't care. Uh, all right, so now I'm center these here. There we go. So now I have a, a cast and crew. Uh, there is an option here where you can do scrolling credits as well if you want to. Scrolling credits don't work very well on a short film because if you, uh, if, if you if it's a very short uh, sequence, the titles tend to fly by and it looks very strobe. You have to have kind of like a very long credit sequence uh, that can play by very slowly so it doesn't have the, especially in 24 frames per second, it turns out to be very strobe. And you have a lot of other features in here you can kind of play around with, but, but make sure that you've got the, the clip selected that you want to edit, and then you can go down and you can mess with like uh, leading and kerning and uh, different font types and sizes, and uh, you can even rotate the text and put it on different angles, a whole bunch of the things you can do with it down here, but those are kind of the basics there. So one other thing I kind of want to do with what I want to do with my movie is oftentimes people, when they play their movie, the movie just like starts immediately. Uh, I like to put a little bit of black at the beginning and end, so people, when, especially if it's like on YouTube, uh, people can go full screen and the movie hasn't started it gives you a second to kind of get everything adjusted and it gets a chance for all the YouTube stuff to kind of disappear so then you can just get to watch the movie so I'm gonna add a little bit of black at the beginning of my video so I'm gonna to go to new item down here hit new item and I'm gonna say new black video that will generate some black video it will base that off of your sequence settings uh, the frame rate and the resolution I hit OK 
There's my black video. You can double click on it. It loads it into the source monitor and you can move this over. You can click on this little time here and type in 200 for two seconds and 00 frames and it jumps in two seconds and 00 frames. I hit O for out point and now I have two seconds of black. Uh, I'm going to go shift three, go to my timeline and I can hit home or end. Right now I'm going to go to home at the beginning of my timeline and hit comma, which is your insert edit and it drops your black video in. Hit end to go to the end. Hit end to go to the end of the timeline and hit comma or period. Now there's no video in front of it, so it doesn't matter. You, you can use period or comma and put in my black video at the end. Okay, so my whole movie is all prepped down there. I have titles, I've color graded, I've sound mixed, and my movie is ready. Uh, we put the black video at the beginning and end, and now I'm ready to export. So the last step here is exporting your movie. Uh, so you can go up to File and go under Export and go to media. The, the shortcut is Command M or Control M on a PC. So Command M will bring open the export window. And on the export window, uh, first of all, you want to make sure that you're sending uh, your entire, I would say rather than se sequence in and out, I would say entire sequence. In fact, let me cancel this and just want to make sure also uh, when you're exporting that you don't have like extra clips in your timeline. Sometimes people will have like a, a, some extra clips here, I'll put some down here. If they've been editing on their timeline, they might have some extra clips way down the timeline. Uh, so what you want to do is when you're, you want to make sure that, because if you export this out, what it's going to do is it's going to export out my movie, then it will have this like uh, two or three minutes of, of black, blank space, and then it will export out these little clip, little floating clips that I have at the end here. So you just want to make sure that you are exporting out just your, your movie and nothing else. So what I usually do is when I'm ready to export, I hit the slash backslash above the enter or return key and it shows your entire timeline. And then I go, oh crap, I've got these other clips out here. I select those, delete them, hit that slash again, and now it's showing my entire sequence here. And I can see that there's nothing else in there. Also, if you have uh, in points and out points on your timeline, it'll, it might look like this. And if you have that, that's an in point and out point, and sometimes it might, might default and export just that portion. So what you'll wanna do is right click up here and clear that, clear in and out. It, that would the, the shortcut for that would be um, would be Option X on a Mac and Control Shift X on a PC. Option X clears that. Control Shift X on a PC will clear that those in and out points. Or you can just right click up there and say clear in and out. Now I'm going to hit Command M or Control M, and we're going to export our movie. So I'm going to make sure. See right there, it's trying to default to the sequence in and out point. So I just pull that down. But now that I don't have an in and out point, it doesn't matter. It'll just export out the whole movie. But just to make sure, entire sequence. Up here, we're going to do the format. If you're uploading to YouTube, uh, probably one of the best ones to use is going to be H.264. It'll be a, a relatively small file compared to like a QuickTime video, like a ProRes QuickTime video. Uh, and you're going to go down to... Uh, I'm going to choose, this is a 4K, so you can upload YouTube 4K. It will take longer to export. It'll be like three or four times large. Uh, the, the, the size will be three or four uh, times the size larger than the original file. It'll take longer to export. It'll take longer to upload. So it just depends on if you want to have it in HD, in HD 1080 or if you want to have it in uh, full uh, 4K uh, HD. So if we choose that, we can choose, a full, this is a 4K timeline, so I'm going to choose that. So we've got that set. And once again, if you're just doing 1080, you'll choose the 1080 but I've got 4K just selected. Okay, so H.264, 4K, and then you're gonna choose the name here. It's exporting video and audio. I'm gonna click on the name here, and this will ask where you wanna save it and what you wanna call it. So I'm gonna put this on my desktop here. So on my desktop, and I'm gonna name this My Movie 4K, so I know it's the 4K version for YouTube. You can name it whatever you want. And now I hit Save, and it has saved the location and the name, and now all I have to do is export. Before I do export, uh, some other options. If you are mastering your movie, this is this will be fine for YouTube, but this is going to be fairly compressed, meaning it's uh, removing a lot of the color data that it doesn't need. So it still will look really good, but it's, it doesn't have the, uh, a lot of color depth to it. If you want to preserve it as a master, if you're going to be exporting it out to different versions later and you're going to be deleting your project or storing it on a hard drive somewhere and you just want to have access to your master, I would say at least do a ProRes. I'm going to say go down to QuickTime. And then we're going to pull this one down and do a preset. And I'm going to do ProRes. Usually ProRes 422 is going to be high enough quality for what most people are doing. If you're shooting in 10-bit color or if you're shooting in 8-bit color or even 10-bit color on your camera and you want to master it, this is going to be essentially be lossless color depth here. And then you can use your master to compress it to other uh, to, to other formats. If you're required to show it like on, on television, if you're required to show it in a movie theater, if you're required to uh, show it on YouTube, uh, you can compress it from this master file into other files. So this, this, this will be a 
a master one. But if you're just exporting to YouTube, just use the YouTube format like I showed. But ProRes 422, and now you can uh, hit export, and that will be a nice high quality, quality master there. Uh, but let's do the YouTube one. So H.264. YouTube, and like I said, the master is going to be a good one to keep for yourself, so you can use it later on, and you can, you can recompress it using something like Media Encoder uh, later on. So export, it will start exporting, and it is finished, and it gives you this little note, your video was exported successfully. So what I like to do is I'm going to hit Command-H to hide this, uh, minimize it there, and you can and you can see my movie's been exported there. So I like to play the video all the way through, just make sure it worked before you upload it. So let's just double click on it. I'm using a Mac, so this is playing it in QuickTime. It, keep in mind, if you're trying to play, uh, if, if you export it out as a master to QuickTime ProRes, which is a nice high quality master, this will not play on a PC under a regular uh, player, like, like the Windows Media Player. Uh, this will only play on, uh, I'd say download VLC. VLC is a great uh, player. In fact, you, I've got it installed. I can just right click and say open in VLC. So th this will play it back, but it won't. VLC will play back ProRes, uh, but but the Windows Movie Player will not. But uh, it, the QuickTime Player on Macintosh will play it back. It's supported. So I can hit uh, Command F, or it's just F on a PC. We'll take it full screen, then play my movie back. We'll be finished here very soon. Let your movie play all the way through. Make sure everything works. Make sure your titles work at the end. And then we've got two seconds in black, and my movie works just fine. So now I've got a nice 4K version that I can upload to YouTube. So that's kind of a beginning to ending uh, process of doing a, a post-production, of doing post-production in Premiere uh, that I'm calling Premiere Pro Essentials. I know that was kind of long, but a little in-depth and just showing you how to get from the beginning to the end of Premiere, and hopefully that will get you started. And if you have any questions or comments, please post them.